The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Kim Cervantes. I'm with the Regional Epidemiology Program. And I'm going to start off real quick by asking Diana to uh, give me a little message if uh, the audio is reaching OK. Okay, I don't hear from Diana. If, if someone can hear me, could you please type into the... Oh, I got it. Great. Thanks, Natalie. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, just as a reminder, the purpose of these meetings is to share information on communicable disease and outbreak investigations between uh, state and local partners. About a year ago in the spring, we conducted a pilot um, in-person communicable disease forum, and we held three meetings in the north, central, and south. Based on um, your feedback, people really wanted to meet in their own public health regions. So this past fall, we held five meetings um, in each of the regions. And uh, we also decided that quarterly was the best format based on your evaluations. So we're going to be doing two webinars in the winter and summer and holding in-person meetings in the spring and fall. Uh, moving ahead for spring, uh, we will be moving to a four-meeting format. So we'll have one in the northeast, one in the northwest. We're combining central because apart from the state people who attended in central west, we only had 20 attendees. So we, uh, we really just can't bring all these people out of the office for, for, that, um, for that size of a group. So we will be combining central west and central east into one meeting. And uh, we're looking for a um, location that can be uh, most central for all of those people, and then uh, keeping one in the south. The topics for today's uh, presentations, uh, looking at hepatitis C investigation, as well as how to interpret different types of laboratory test results, were selected based on the topics that you um, requested on the uh, participant evaluation. So, we really are using the feedback that you're providing, and uh, we will have an evaluation for today and uh, we appreciate the feedback. In terms of credits, uh, today's program has been approved for 2.5 public health credits, and uh, I'm very happy to say we're, for the first time, able in CDS to give nursing contact hours for a webinar. So there'll be 2.5 credits on both. And uh, I'll go over how those credits will work at the end of today's webinar. Some Program updates, um, hopefully most of you are receiving emails from your regional epidemiologist. Uh, we do maintain contact lists so we can get information out to you quickly. Um, these it, emails focus on communicable disease investigators. They include the health officers and uh, many of the infection preventionists. So if you're not receiving email communications and would like to, uh, please reach out to your regional epi. The quarterly highlight report we've been uh, sending out showing uh, a highlight of uh, communicable disease trends and activities in your region. The uh, fourth quarter for October through December should be coming out early next week um, from your regional epidemiologist, so stay tuned for that. And uh, with the next report, we'll be including a brief survey uh, to try to get your feedback on how useful the report is and on whether you would like different information. And uh, just to mention on telephone contact information, I've listed here uh, the phone numbers you're all familiar with, our daytime number and off hours. Um, it, it's very important to use those phone numbers because we have, uh, we have procedures in place to, uh, to identify the right people to get the call. So even though uh, you may know the uh, direct extension or the cell phone of the regional epidemiologist that you're working with, sometimes that can actually result in a delayed response. Uh, if that person's out of the office or working on other activities. So uh, we would encourage you to use those main numbers. And if they need to reach out to the regional epidemiologist, uh, again, the, the staff answering those phones know how to do that. Some technical information. Uh, we are using the integrated audio, so you can um, either be on the toll, toll phone number or you'll be using your computer speakers or microphone. Um, all the participants are on mute. And at the end of each presentation, we will have time for questions. Um, and we'll have a general question and answer session at the end. Uh, so if we don't get to them within the particular presentation, we will get to them at the end. To ask a question, you can type a question into the question or chat box um, at any time during today, and uh, we'll make sure we respond to those. 
Uh, if for some reason we don't have time to address all of them, I'll be sure to send out an email after the webinar uh, with the answers to those questions. We are recording today's webinar, so assuming all goes well, the uh, recorded webinar will be posted on NJLMN for a limited uh, period of time. So if you have colleagues who are unable to listen today, uh, they will be able to watch it um, as an online course offering on NJLMN. And the slides for today are posted on NJLMN under Practice Exchange. Uh, they're there in thumbnail and full page versions uh, because some of the slides do have some data on them that um, may not be real readable in the thumbnail. So you can print that particular page from the full page um, file. OK, the agenda I'm not going to go over because hopefully you all received that. Uh, but basically, we're going to adjourn around 12.15. And uh, these are the nursing um, disclosure slides. So uh, I am going to read these um, as is required. Uh, participants must attend the entire session to earn contact hour credits, uh, participate in law learning activities. A verification of participation will be on the webinar attendance report or a group sign-in sheet um, and completion of an evaluation. And again, I'll go over specifically how this works at the end. Um, you can't miss uh, any uh, significant period of time for the presentation, and you have to complete the evaluation. Um, on the online evaluation, there will be room for the nurses to include a name and email address, and that's how you'll get your nursing certificate. No commercial support has influenced any of the educational objectives or the content of today's event. No influential relationships have been disclosed, and there's no endorsement of any product uh, associated with this session. Okay, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Barbara Montana, uh, Medical Director for the Communicable Disease Service, and she's going to be talking about uh, the different ins and outs of interpreting laboratory test results. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Just getting going here. I just want to start by saying that this is a huge topic and um, it's very hard to cover anything significant in this limited period of time. So what I really want to do is just sort of give you an overview and a vocabulary and just a thought process for um, how to think when you're looking at lab test results that, that you might see. So this is my favorite quote and something that I always talk to physicians about. Um, oftentimes, tests are ordered, and uh, when you get the result, you really don't know how you're going to act on it because you really didn't think it through in advance. So remember, ordering a diagnostic lab test is like picking your nose in public. You must first consider what you will do if you find something. So what I hope to do is provide an overview of pathogens in general, describe some of the lab tests that you might see in public health investigations, understand the immune response to an organism, because I think that's going to help to, uh, to make you understand how we view these tests, and then understand the use of lab tests in communicable disease investigations. So, Microorganisms are out there. There are different kinds of microorganisms. There's the bacterial uh, organisms, which are single cells. Uh, examples are your salmonella, your strep, your staph, your E. coli. And then some organisms cause disease directly, and some organisms produce toxins that actually are causing the disease. And the one that comes to mind is Clostridium difficile, C. diff where it's actually the toxin that's causing the injury and not the organism itself. In fact, people can be colonized by C. diff and not have disease. It's only when they start producing that toxin that they become ill. The other organisms that we commonly encounter are viruses, and they have genetic material, either DNA or RNA, that's surrounded by a protective coat of protein. And the viruses that we commonly hear about, influenza, especially this time of year, HIV, West Nile, neuro, uh, and then your common cold viruses, like your coronaviruses and 
your rhinoviruses. And then there are other pathogens out there, your parasites and uh, your, your fungi. Specimens are really important uh, in any sort of an evaluation, public health or clinical. Uh, there are the clinical specimens that we commonly get reports on, the sputum, the blood, the stool, the urine, and other fluids. And then sometimes we deal with environmental samples, food samples, especially if you're thinking about a foodborne outbreak, water samples, um, thinking of the uh, investigation of uh, salmonella in a lake, uh, surfaces, things like uh, medical equipment or countertops as well. It's really important that specimens be handled appropriately. Oftentimes people get specimens and send them off and in the process between the actual acquisition and the actual testing, there are a lot of problems along the way that can affect the test results. So you have, you have to collect the right sample, organisms within certain parts of the body, and you need to make sure that you're getting it from the right place. You need to make sure that you're putting it in the right uh, medium in order to optimize survival. It needs to be collected from the patient or environment at the appropriate time. So for instance, in a measles case, you if you collect a blood specimen for IgM within 72 hours of rash onset, you may get a false negative because the person hasn't had the time to develop that IgM antibody. So it really needs to be collected at the right time. So early on in an investigation for measles, for instance, you would want to actually look for the virus in clinical specimens, and then after that 72-hour period, the serum is more useful because then you would be testing the antibody level. The specimen needs to be transported within the proper time frame and temperature. So if you're getting a specimen and you're leaving it out on a countertop for a period of time, that organism may die and uh, that specimen is no longer useful. And then really important, and I think this is where we often fall down, is that we don't tell the laboratory what we're thinking. We don't give them the information that they need to work on the specimen appropriately. And oftentimes, you know, a specimen will come in, and, and from their perspective, it's basically like, you know, what am I thinking? They have no clue what the clinical presentation is or what the clinician or the public health professional is thinking, so they don't know how to appropriately process that. And we often get into that situation when specimens are sent for generic viral testing uh, because they may not be looking for the virus that we're thinking of. They may not be looking for the mumps virus. They may be looking for some other panel of viruses uh, that they commonly do when they receive a specimen for viral testing. Lab identification of an organism is really crucial uh, because it really helps us to, uh, to determine our clinical response as well as our public health response. Oftentimes it's hard to tell what a person has based on symptoms alone. A lot of times uh, different organisms cause similar symptoms. The clinical symptoms may be unclear or nonspecific and physicians may not recognize a rare disease. And we're seeing that now. All of a sudden, we're getting lots and lots of calls for people with fevers and rashes. Uh, people think that it might be measles. Physicians haven't seen measles. Physicians haven't seen chicken pox. We have uh, somebody working with us now who is a, a young physician who says that he has not seen chicken pox or measles. So it's really important um, to get the specimens so that we can actually determine what's causing the problem so that then we can initiate a, a responsible public health intervention. We don't want to be isolating tons of people because we think they have measles when, in fact, they have something completely different. Uh, it's also important to get specimens because that will allow us to connect individual cases in an outbreak. So if we're actually able to get the organism, we can do molecular uh, 
typing of the organism. We can actually look at the genetic sequences to see if they match. And what comes to mind is our outbreak of hepatitis in Ocean County, um, where we were able to pinpoint the point uh, the um, the office as the source by linking all of these individual viruses molecularly. They were all identical molecularly. So that really helps us to hone in on what the source of the infection might be. And then to, uh, it's really important to have a diagnosis so that we can make sure that people are treated appropriately from the medical perspective and that we take the appropriate public health protective measures. Um, meningitis is, is a clinical description, really. Lots of things can cause meningitis. Bacterial infections can cause uh, uh, meningitis as well as viral infections. And we don't want to undertake an investigation for meningococcal disease unless we're sure that that actually is the organism that is causing the infection. And then oftentimes uh, we get ourselves in trouble by not confirming a diagnosis up front. I'm thinking in particular of scabies outbreaks uh, where people start treating clinically and undertaking a response without ever having actually seen that organism. And then you're down the road several months and people are coming up with rashes and you don't know if you have scabies or not and the thing just keeps snowballing and people get empirically treated and then the specimens get taken after they've been treated and then you don't know if the scrapings were negative because the um, person was treated or because there really wasn't scabies to begin with. So it's always important to have that diagnosis up front. How the organism is identified depends on the type of organism. Some of the methods are well established for a particular organism. There are guidelines for identifying the particular organism, how to collect the specimen, as well as what the lab will do to identify that organism once it gets the specimen on its end. And something to point out is that sometimes what we accept for public health case definitions is not the same thing as what might be used to help a clinician make a diagnosis. And oftentimes that's confusing for everyone because a clinician will be saying the person has X, Y, and Z, and the individual just doesn't meet our public health case definition, and we're not calling it a case even though the clinician says that that's what the person has. And I think that that's a source of confusion for everybody, uh, particularly when you're trying to explain it to the press or the lay people because they don't understand why uh, there's a difference between the clinical world and the public health world. There are different ways to identify an organism. Microscopy, looking at something under a microscope. Uh, there's a culture where you're actually growing the organism. Then there are uh, tests that are based on the genetic material of the organism, your nucleic acid-based identification tests, looking for the RNA or the DNA. And then there are your immunologic tests which depend on some sort of an interaction between the organism and an immune system. Microscopy, we're all familiar with. Your gram stains, it uses stains and reagents. It's quick and easy. You can get it right away. Uh, smaller organisms require more special techniques like electron microscopy, especially viruses where you can't see it under a regular microscope. Uh, sometimes the organism may be there but you just don't have enough of them to see, and that often happens in um, things like meningococcal meningitis, where somebody clearly has a meningococcal disease. It's clearly bacterial, given the other uh, parameters that you're seeing in the CSF, but you just can't see the organism because there aren't enough there to actually see. And gram stain is one of the things that we know about. Acid fast stains, that's for TB and organisms like TB. India ink. Uh, stains, right stains, trichrome stains for parasites. These are all the kinds of uh, techniques that are used for staining to view organisms under the microscope. Culture is really the gold standard. Uh, the problem is organisms often need time to grow. Viruses need cells to grow. They can't grow on their own. Not all pathogens can be cultured. Uh, we don't aim for culture for a lot of pathogens, things like rabies virus, you wouldn't send a rabies uh, culture. You need the right medium to grow, um, so you have to have that medium available when you're getting the specimen. 
um, thinking of you know viral cultures, it's, it's ideal to have viral culture medium to send the specimen in. Sometimes we can get away with things like just a, a non-preserved buffered saline solution to transport that specimen to the laboratory. Culture doesn't detect past infections, so if you miss the window to get that specimen, you're sort of lost from actually isolating the organism. And in that case, you may need to do other kinds of testing like serology. And culture can be affected by things like antibiotic or antiviral treatment. And oftentimes, people have taken uh, some sort of treatment before they even present to the physician, and certainly um, before they enter the public health world, sometimes people will have been treated and then will say to the physician, did you get X, Y, and Z, and they'll say no, but by that point, the uh, specimen is not going to be helpful if the person has already been on treatment. And uh, if you can get a culture, then not only can you identify the organism, but you can also do sensitivity testing to make sure that you're treating appropriately. And if you have the organism, you can also do that molecular testing to link the organisms, uh, as I described before, uh, to, to see if there's a common source for this particular uh, outbreak. The nucleic acid base identification tests look for the genetic material, the DNA or RNA, depending on the particular virus. Uh, the test amplifies the amount of material that you have, so you can have very little bit of material and still get a good result. The tests that we commonly see are your PCR, your polymerase chain reaction, your real-time um, uh, PCR, also your uh, reverse transcriptase, PCR, these are all things that you might see uh, listed as the test. These are highly sensitive, and because they're sensitive, sometimes you can get false positive results from trace contamination. Um, this test can detect organisms that are dead, so if somebody has started on treatment, this test may still be positive. And, um, this test can be used for diagnosis as well as to follow treatment. And oftentimes, you'll see lots of these tests popping up for people on treatment for viral hepatitis. So uh, physicians will serially check their uh, hepatitis C RNA to see if the level is going down with treatment. Similarly, you might see that for hepatitis B. When people are on treatment, physicians will serially check the amount of virus in the blood to see if the treatment is working. And that oftentimes becomes confusing for us because we'll see these tests popping up in CDRSS, and it's just because the physician is following treatment. It's not because there's a new case that's, that's being diagnosed. And similarly, you can also show clonality during an outbreak. Now, your immunologic tests are out there. Um, there's a lot of them. And these are just the names, and I'm not going to go into a description of all of them because, again, this is, I think, beyond the scope of what I can cover in this limited amount of time. But agglutination tests, precipitation tests, uh, fluorescent antibody tests, complement fixation, EIA uh, or ELISA, which are your en enzyme immunoassays, and then your more confirmatory tests that you'll see are your Weston plots or your Rebus, which are your recombinant immunoblot assays. And these are the kinds of things that you'll see for um, HIV testing. They'll often do an ELISA first, and then they'll confirm it with a Weston blot. And similarly for uh, Lyme disease, where they'll often do a, um, uh, an, an EIA kind of test followed by a more specific uh, Reba test or Weston blot test. Um, the body has a lot of different kinds of immune responses after they've been, after the body has been exposed to an organism. The body has an innate response, which is a general nonspecific response. And it's sort of like the body just calling out all of the troops when it's being invaded by a particular organism. They don't know who the invader is at the time, but there are cells that will come into play and start trying to kill these, these invaders. Your complement system, your natural killer cells, your cytokines, they're all sort of nonspecific responses that will kick in. And then you have your general host defenses, your intact skin, your mucous membranes, which are good in protecting anything from getting into the body in the first place. 
And then there's the adaptive or more specific immune response that's geared toward a particular organism. Your cellular response, where there are cells in your body that are each response to specific organisms after you've seen that organism. And then you have, there's the humoral response, which is your antibody response. And again, that becomes more specific with time and will be your lifelong memory for responding to organisms in the future. Your active immunity is uh, immunity to a specific organism or a toxin that results from either natural exposure or from vaccination. Vaccination is a good way to, uh, to produce active immunity without making the host sick. Uh, passive immunity is immunity to a specific microorganism that results from a transfer of preformed antibody. So you can get preformed antibody transferred through breastfeeding. You can get it transferred through the placenta, particularly your IgG, which is transmitted from the mother to uh, the infant. And you can also give somebody that antibody after they've been exposed or before they've been exposed to the organism intravenously or intramuscularly in the form of an immune globulin. And we do that for people who are exposed to rabies. We do that for people who are exposed to varicella, who are in particular risk groups. We do that for people who are exposed to measles, who are at particularly high risk if they should contract that infection. So what happens when you're exposed to an organism? We see this organism is foreign. The organism has particular antigens that you're going to respond to. And this is a whole host of um, the, the body's cells that can respond. And you can see it's very complicated. There's um, bone marrow that, that houses a lot of these immune cells that all come into play after you've been exposed to a particular organism. And um, what we commonly see are antibody tests. Your IgG and your IgM are ones that commonly come into play during the investigation. Um, these are the kinds of immunoglobulins that are out there, the IgG, the IgA, which is predominantly a mucosal antibody. It's secreted and it hangs out in the mucous membranes and is really your first line of defense. Your IgM which is um, the first immunoglobulin that, will you, that you will produce after you see an organism for the first time. It's large and bulky, and it doesn't transmit through the placenta. So if a baby has IgM, then that's a good indication that the baby was actually infected because the IgG will go from the mother to the baby, but uh, the IgM can't. So that's a good indicator if you're seeing an IgM in a baby that's probably a true infection and not something that was transmitted from the mother. There's an IgD, D, which we really don't deal with that much and we don't see commonly in, in test results. And then there's your IgE, which we don't deal with much in public health. That's really a, uh, an allergic reaction uh, immune globulin and that people who deal with allergy will deal with IgE response. So the IgM is the first antibody that's produced in response to an infection. It's a marker of recent infection. It's located in the blood and lymph fluid, and it stimulates other immune system cells to generate um, a response that's capable of eliminating the foreign cells. Only about 5 to 10 percent of the antibodies in your body floating around are your IgM. Your IgG is located in all types of body fluids. It makes up the majority of the antibodies in your, in your body. It's considered to be the most important in fighting organisms, and it's the most specific. And it permeates the placenta, as I mentioned, and will be transmitted uh, to a newborn to protect that newborn for, for a certain period of time. This is a nice um, uh, graph showing the immune response over time. So when you're first exposed to an organism, you will start producing immune globulin. And you'll have a total immune globulin. The primary will be your IgM after you're first exposed. And then slowly, you will start getting your IgG response. And it's the IgG that you retain. Your IgM usually goes down with time. And then there's, after some variable time, uh, a, a secondary exposure. For that secondary exposure, 
it's a little different in that now you have these cells that recognize the organism and they're going to start kicking out that IgG. And it's actually your IgG which you may see pop up first. And it's only after time that you actually may get that secondary IgM response. And this is really important when you're talking about a response in somebody who's been vaccinated. So if you're doing an investigation of somebody with suspected mumps who's been uh, vaccinated, you may not see that positive IgM response like you would for a primary investigation or primary infection. Um, one thing to talk about is acute and convalescent specimens. Oftentimes we will use that as um, uh, as sort of a, a second line when we didn't get what we needed up front to confirm the diagnosis. So we missed the opportunity to actually isolate the organism. Now it's several weeks down the line, uh, diagnosis has been uh, proposed and we need to somehow figure out if that's what the person actually had. So we suggest acute and convalescent specimens. Uh, you need to draw the specimen at time zero, and then you need to draw the specimen sometime in the future and compare those titers. And usually we consider a fourfold rise as being significant. And that varies depending on the disease that you're investigating. Sometimes there are specific parameters for what might be considered uh, positive for that particular disease. It's ideal if you could collect those specimens and store those and run those specimens in the same lab at the same time so that you can be sure that the specimens are handled at, in the same way so you can actually compare those results. Oftentimes they're sent different places at different times and it's really hard to ensure that you're measuring apples to apples and oranges to oranges. Uh, the limitations, it's not useful for rapid intervention because, again, it's going to take weeks to get that second specimen and run those specimens, and it's often difficult to get people to get that second specimen. We can't often get the specimens we want the first time, let alone having the person come back a couple of weeks later to get a second specimen. Uh, as I mentioned, it's useful when the pathogen is not easily detected by the specimens that we collected. Uh, when the source of exposure has been eliminated, and for research purposes as well. So what does this all mean? Um, it's pretty hard to interpret all of these tests in isolation. Just some pearls to leave you with. All things being equal, we really like the tests that identify the organism directly rather than indirectly by measuring the host response to the organism. If you got the organism there, you're pretty sure that that's really what's causing the problem, although that's not 100% true, but that's usually true. Many factors influence the test results. Uh, oftentimes there may be a problem with the person so that they can't mount an antibody response. So somebody who has HISD infection or an elderly person may truly have that infection, but we measure the antibodies and it doesn't come up as positive on our test because they just don't have the ability to mount that response. Uh, the timing of the test relative to the exposure may influence the test results. As I, as I mentioned, if you're testing for measles, the day that the rash appears, you may not yet have that positive IgM. You may need to wait a few days after 72 hours in order to actually get that positive test result. Vaccination status definitely influences the test result. Um, as I mentioned, with, with mumps, uh, you can have an acute case of mumps and not have a positive IgM in an individual who was vaccinated. That's why we really stress getting that viral specimen, um, getting that buccal swab, trying to isolate that virus because the serology may not be helpful in a vaccinated individual. And previous exposure in general, not just vaccination, but natural infection as well can influence that test result. And receipt of blood products that might contain antibodies will certainly uh, interfere with your ability to do some of the testing. Also things to remember, an individual can be protected with no detectable antibodies. So we see this a lot of times in people who were vaccinated for hepatitis 
deep infection, if you test them many years after that vaccination, they actually may not have detectable IgG. They might not have detectable surface antibody, but yet if they're exposed to the virus, they can mount an efficient response that IgG picks up and the person is actually protected. That's why for things like hepatitis B, if you need to check antibody, like in a healthcare worker, you want to make sure that you're doing it for one to two months after that vaccination surgery was complete, so you're catching that antibody, and then you're considering that person, if they have the level that you need, protected for life, even if that antibody level should wane with time. Um, we also know that the presence of detectable antibodies doesn't always protect against disease. And the diseases that come to mind are hepatitis C and HIV, where people have lots of antibodies, that's how we make the diagnosis, but that's not protecting them, they still have chronic infection. People can still develop illness despite documented immune globulin, and that's unfortunate because we often use that as our gold standard for determining immunity. So we have had situations where um, healthcare workers have had IgG documented and still get symptomatic infection. We had a situation in Somerset where we had a healthcare worker who had documented IgG on, on uh, employment and was exposed intensely to a child with measles, and that healthcare worker did, in fact, develop measles. Now, in those situations, the infection is usually not as severe, and we think that those individuals are not as infectious to others because they mount a quick antibody response, their IgG goes up, and then they're not shedding virus for as long. But that's a little bit theoretical. Laboratory tests always have to be interpreted in the context of the clinical information and other labs, and, and I think that's hard because we often don't have all of that information up front, and it takes a lot of work to try to get that information. Uh, it's hard to interpret an isolated uh, hepatitis test. You really need to see that, particularly for hepatitis B, you need to really see that in the context of the other lab tests, the liver function tests can be very helpful. And again, was the person sick? Did they have symptoms consistent with that particular infection like hepatitis? Uh, a positive lab test might be helpful in determining if somebody has a disease, but a negative lab test doesn't necessarily rule out the disease. And again, that's for all of the, the reasons that I mentioned before. Sometimes we just don't handle the specimen correctly, uh, or the test wasn't timed appropriately. So if somebody you think really has measles, but the viral specimen comes back negative, they may still really have measles. It's just that we couldn't isolate the virus for whatever reason. And I think one of the single most important questions to ask when you're doing an investigation of the patient and of the healthcare provider is why was this test ordered? A lot of times uh, you'll find that these wacky tests were ordered by mistake. Uh, people didn't really intend to order that test and now you're, you're stuck with this particular result, uh, or you'll find out that it was ordered for some benign reason. For instance, somebody needed a pre-employment physical and the test was just done as part of that, and the individual is not sick. And obviously, you're going to interpret that test result uh, much differently than if the person has the classic symptoms uh, of a particular illness. We saw this a lot with varicella with positive IgM. There are a lot of false positive IgMs for varicella. So if you call the physician and you say, why was this ordered, um, and they say for pre-employment physical, it's very different than if they say the person was covered in spots from head to toe, and they're really suspecting that the individual has acute varicella disease. So just um, one example, and, and I picked mumps. Um, unfortunately, I didn't pick measles, which is probably what I should be focusing on now, given uh, what's out in the news and, and happening all over. Um, this is just a typical uh, case definition that you'll see, where you'll have your, um, your clinical symptoms, and then you'll have the lab that would support this public health uh, uh, case classification. And in this particular case, uh, of mumps, the tests that are used for case classification include your serology, your IgM, and your IgG, and your PCR, and your, your mumps culture. And this is uh, from 
the material that we have available for how to collect an appropriate specimen. As I mentioned, the collection is really important, making sure that you're getting the testing done uh, at the appropriate time and that you're uh, handling it appropriately, putting the specimen in the appropriate viral medium or saline if you don't have the viral medium available, and then storing it appropriately, transporting it appropriately, and making sure that the laboratory knows exactly that you're looking for mumps and not some other uh, generic viral infection. And this is uh, an overview from the CDC website of lab confirmation uh, by IgM serology. And I'm pointing out again here that how you interpret this depends on the vaccination status of the individual. It is really hard to interpret the serology in an individual who is vaccinated. And that's why we really push for viral specimens in people who have uh, a vaccine history for mumps as well as for measles. Okay. Um, this are, I already mentioned, interpretation can be difficult in vaccinated individuals. And with that, I'm, I'm advanced here now. Sorry, we're having technical difficulties. Okay. Um, if you have a, any questions, uh, type them into the question box. Um, Barb, we have one here on uh, Lyme disease, and we also have um, Shireen Semple will be in later, so if we want to defer part of this. But uh, the question is that uh, we often see physicians ordering IgG and EIAs monthly for a long period of time. Isn't this costly, and what is the physician's purpose in running monthly tests? Um, now, the second question I think is probably relevant for Shireen, but um, since Lyme disease is not really a communicable disease, is it anticipated that health departments will continue to have to investigate all elevated IgG and two-tier positive results? I'm going to answer the first part as a clinician. There is no benefit to doing that, so I don't know why physicians are doing that. There is no correlation between um, the level or the persistence of IgG uh, and treatment benefits or treatment failures. So uh, there's, there's no guidelines that I am aware of uh, for repeat testing of somebody who has been diagnosed with Lyme disease. And the second part, I'll defer to, to Shireen. We'll address that later. Okay. Um, another question um, with a, concerning a, a buccal swab for mumps, uh, that in the absence of uh, the viral transport media, can the physician use saline? Yeah. Okay. So that's the yes on that. And um, I think we have, I don't know if it's under the mumps, we can ask Liz when she comes in, but certainly under the measles, we have the guidelines for uh, specimen collection, and it talks about being put in a buffered saline and being transported in there. Okay. All right. Um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to type them in at any time, and uh, we can also get to those. Uh, at the end of today. And uh, with that, I'm going to um, turn it over to Ellen Rudowski, uh, who is the Hepatitis C coordinator. And uh, again, on the participant evaluations, Hepatitis C is one of the most um, popular topics uh, that are requested. So uh, hopefully, um, Ellen has a pretty comprehensive uh, presentation, and uh, also we can take some questions. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to Ellen. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for your time and interest in attending this webinar. Today I'm going to be talking about hepatitis C surveillance, case investigation, and public response. Uh, this PowerPoint presentation, my slide on? Oh, my, uh, this PowerPoint presentation is meant to be used as a, sort of a guidance, so I am going to be telling a story. Everything I mention is in the uh, document. Uh, that you can refer to uh, later on. Unfortunately, I am going to use all of my 35 minutes, and I'm hoping not to um, get the hook. So uh, the, the objectives of the, this PowerPoint presentation is to define the purpose of hep C, 
um, also known as HCV surveillance. I'm going to review statewide and county uh, annual statistics uh, and rates of reported infection for 2011, 2012, and 2013. Provide an overview of currently utilized Hep C serology studies. I want to reinforce um, New Jersey Department of Health health population uh, based case management strategy. Review the 2012 case definition for Hep C acute and Hep C past or present. Just uh, describe some exciting uh, collaborations uh, we have going on with other divisions in the state and talk about um, the, uh, give you an update on the New Jersey General Assembly proposed Hep C testing bills uh, A255 and A, uh, A 876. So to start, um, the purpose of Hep C surveillance is to define the burden of disease in New Jersey, identify vi viral hepatitis outbreaks, obtain uh, person-focused behavioral beliefs and trends um, that seem to be uh, transmission uh, um, avenues for illness and roadblocks for individuals to access care, being testing, treatment, and follow-up. Um, develop targeted and evaluate effectiveness of our prevention activities and educational men, um, messages. Our priorities with um, uh, the investigation, the slide, if the slide isn't forwarding up there, does that mean? Uh, I'm seeing purpose. What are you seeing? Uh, well, now it just went ahead to another slide. I was doing priorities, investigation okay. priorities. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Um, so the priority for our investigation is identification of acute cases, investigate healthcare associated transmission of disease, detect and trace back common source of outbreaks, identify new modes or risk factors for transmission, provide patient hep C education, including methods of transmission, and reinforce liver preservation methods, all of which I will um, talk about a little bit later. So in 2013, we had nine, over 9,300 uh, cases of hep C created in CDRSS. There were over 20 600 duplicate cases that were merged to individuals previously reported uh, to the State Department of Health as being hep C positive. And deduping the system is important for two reasons. Number one, it's going to show us, show us the true incidence of hepatitis C infection in the state of New Jersey. But most important, why um, would a local health department reinvestigate a report of positive hep C serology when we already know that the individual has been positive since 2005. In addition, we have um, over uh, 6,600 new cases of disease reported via electronic lab uh, reporting or through manual um, data entry. We're very fortunate in the state of New Jersey, there are now six commercial labs that report directly into CDRSS, um, Arab Bioreference, LabCorp, Mayo Clinic, Quest Horsheim, and Quest Peterborough. In addition, there's 19 New Jersey um, hospitals that um, report via ELR, as well as uh, the State Public Health Lab and New York State. And these cases, this, um, 6,000, uh, 686 cases are classified as newly diagnosed or newly reported. So they are not known um, in CBRSS. Hi, guys. So the next slide, when it comes up, is um, 2013 staff um, for New Jersey and Oh, there we go, and all the counties. And it's showing the hepatitis, uh, incidence of hepatitis across the board. Now, this is the data that we reported to the CDC. So you see hep A, hep B perinatal, hep B acute, hep B chronic, hep C acute, and hep C chronic. All the counties are listed by numbers. 
down the bottom you see the um, statewide totals for the diseases across the board. And then using the estimated um, state population for 2013 of over um, 8 million 900,000 for chronic for uh, chronic hep C, we see that 74 uh, cases per 100,000 population. There were just two things that I uh, want to point out on this slide when you look at acute hep C. Um, in Camden County, you see there's a high number of uh, 22. Um, Camden County hospitals often are the ones that process uh, outpatient lab studies for um, uh, patients. And uh, we have a great relationship with the IEPs in that county who give us all the clinical information uh, that we need, whether or not it's inpatient, uh, ER, or outpatient visits. In addition, uh, 2012 and 2013, I utilized interns to uh, investigate uh, all the cases in Camden County. So we do have like an 86% uh, response rate um, from the physicians. I am going to be doing another webinar in regards to um, how to efficiently case manage such high volume of, of diseases and uh, we can see here the tricks that um, we use to get that, um, that, that high response rate. The next two slides are um, the incident per 100,000 of population for each one of your counties that you can uh, review at a later time. Um, so here's the first slide came up and you can see on the left, it's Alaska County with the estimated 2013 population. If you follow the blue line, of course, it gives you the incidence of illness as we reported to the CDC for 2013. And the white line below it gives you the rate per 100,000. So uh, this is, is a document, these two slides, um, that you can review at a later time. And on both of the slides down the bottom, I did uh, restate the state population and the incidence of illnesses per 100,000. So, what these um, graphs and statistics show is the fact that we have high volume of hepatitis C cases being reported. And how does one uh, manage that? Um, so we set our, our population-based focus strategy here in New Jersey. And we first look at individuals 25 year, years and younger trying to identify individuals uh, with perinatal transmission. So infants born of a mom that is hep C positive. We know um, that there's an increase in IV drug use among 18 to 24 year olds. So when we talk about trace back of common source of exposure, we want to interview all these individuals, determine how them and their physician feel that they um, acquired hepatitis C and investigate whether or not there was um, any sharing of supplies or tattooing done in someone's basement. Uh, we also want to rule out healthcare associated infections. The individual 60 and older, again, we want to rule out healthcare associated infections. I also have to point out that in July 2012, the CDC recommended that all individuals born between 1945 and 1965 uh, one time in their life we tested for hep C. So when we're investigating um, individuals born within those age and the 60 is included there, the first question is why was um, the testing done? If it's just done um, as uh, baby boomer testing, then, then that's just fine. We also look at the medical facility. So who was the referring medical facility that requested the testing? If you see um, that it is done by an urgent care, student health, an infirmary, um, or if you live in an a area where physicians don't use emergency rooms as their um, uh, home health, uh, no, I said that backwards, as their health care home, um, then you would want to investigate those cases. In addition, if, there, if it's the testing is being ordered by a provider that is associated with a high-risk venue, oncology, pain centers, dental care, podiatry, dialysis. We want to know why the testing was done. So now for, you know, 
just as an example of oncology centers, pain centers, or dialysis centers are ordering the hep C testing for screening prior to treatment, that would be a beautiful thing. We just need to make sure that there wasn't an incident of elevated liver enzymes or an individual being symptomatic or yellow uh, jaundice, and then the testing was done after. It's important to look at um, cases sharing a common address. We have had some um, outbreaks with IV drug use, uh, sharing of um, needles, and uh, uh, identify them through a common address. And in addition, we want to look at residential living centers, whether it's long-term care, assisted living, boarding homes, to see if there's any common uh, exposures there. If uh, long-term care facilities are sharing glucometer uh, supplies uh, or uh, glucometer meeting, uh, meters. So unfortunately, um, like our other hepatitis uh, partners, there is no one test that will differentiate between acute and chronic hep C. Thus, here's another barrier. So what this slide shows is um, that there are two different areas uh, that we look at for hep C testing. On the left-hand side, there's hep C antibody testing. And on the right-hand side, there's nucleic acid, acid testing. Um, you might see that as NAT testing, which um, identifies the hep C RNA virus. So looking on the left-hand side at the top, um, the anti-hep C EIA screening antibody and the rapid um, hep C antibody test are just screening tests, non-confirmatory, and not reported to New Jersey State Department of Health. What is reported is the hep C signal uh, to cutoff ratio with the result at 95 Predict, percent predictive confirmatory index, which means that when this specimen is then tested with um, uh, a nucleic acid testing format, 95% of the time it's positive. There's a note down the bottom that the REBO, which still remains in the hep C case definition, um, has no longer been manufactured since 31912. So we are waiting for that to be taken out of the uh, case definition. On the nucleic acid uh, side, we have the RNA qualitative um, testing, which is a positive or negative result. The RNA uh, quantitative, which gives us a numerical value in international units per um, milliliters. And then there's the hep C genotype. Uh, prior to the webinar, we did have a question in regards to if you receive a lab slip with indeterminate uh, genotype, um, indeterminate, that that's not a positive result. And I do just want to point out that each test assay also uh, requires a minimal viral load in order to be able um, to detect the genotype. So Mayo Clinic will say they need 1,000 uh, inter international units per milliliter and average 1,200. Um, but I know that Mayo Clinic can process the test for as low as 300. But that might be why you are, you are getting those results. So there are six genotypes, one through six for hep C, and subtyping um, A and B for each. I just wanted to talk to you about the serology studies. Um, hep C RNA can usually be detected within one to three weeks after exposure. However, there are some individuals that you may not detect the RNA for um, uh, six months. So when an individual has one um, negative NAT test, it should be, be repeated in um, at, at six months or later from a recent exposure. Now the antibody test, the screening test that we um, do first, um, can, the, that antibody can usually be uh, detected in eight to nine weeks. 97% of individuals uh, launch an immune response uh, in hep C antibodies um, by six months after exposure. Up to 10% of hep C, acute hep C cases will be negative for the antibody. They haven't yet launched the anti antibody response, so we're just seeing the RNA positive. And less than 3% remain negative um, 
with, uh, in regards to antibody response, even with prolonged follow-up. And we see that in individuals that are uh, immunocompromised. I just wanted to throw in there that 60 to 70 percent of newly infected individuals are usually asymptomatic or have mild uh, clinical illness. Uh, in regards to the signal to cut off uh, test assays, I spoke about um, um, a predictive value at 95 percent uh, true positive. This is a slide from the CDC. It gives you the test name, the manufacturer, and what those 95% um, cutoff ranges are. Now, this would be helpful if you knew what labs use what test. So I gave you Ellen Radowski's little cheat sheet. Um, and so this is what we, um, uh, what we see, what everyone uses. I do want to point out that quest diagnostic, although the uh, the assay that they use um, uh, has a predictive, 95% predictive value of greater than or equal to 8. We usually see um, not the index, but the actual number, like 28.5. There's other labs that do that, but in CDRSS, you see that um, often with Quest. Um, with the signal to cut off, again, it requires a numerical value. This is an issue that we're currently having in CDRSS. Um, it is an antibody, so individuals might enter the test as testing antibody. Um, if you're missing a numerical value, please click on the test name itself. Often laboratory staff will enter the test results um, on the left-hand side uh, at, under test value, and this field does not show in your laboratory um, tab in CDRSS. Mayo Clinic, they are reporting through electronic lab reporting. Um, however, their results come in with a value of positive. When you click on that test in the interpretive message, once again, it will say greater than or equal to 8. If you, you might come across older cases that were created by the Department of Health, um, you know, back in 2005, 2008 or 9. And if you see viral reference as the referencing lab, um, please note that the numerical value for this is greater than or equal to 8. Viral reference only considers um, a test result of 95% um, true positive as a positive result. Everything else is negative. And our protocol back then, just due to mass volume, was to enter the lab and not and the positive uh, res, um, result, but not the numerical value. Supportive labs that we use with all the hepatitis um, are the ALT, the AST, um, total bilirubin, alphoxetase sometimes. Uh, real important, um, there is a proposed revision to NJAC 857, Communicable Disease Reporting, that in the event of uh, reporting a reportable hep uh, hepatitis serology study, um, the ALT, AST, and total bilirubin uh, also be reported. That being said, any um, facility that is reporting um, hepatitis C via ELR is also including um, the ALT, AST, and total bilirubin. So at a quick glance, we can tell right off the bat whether this is acute or chronic illness. Some other um, tests that uh, I find helpful in determining whether or not it's acute drug toxicity screening um, to tell whether or not this is acute infection or an accidental or intentional overdose of poisoning is a uh, acetaminophen level, uh, elevated levels of alcohol, or illicit drugs. This is the um, uh, progression of uh, hepatitis C infection from acute to chronic. You can see this slide um, in motion at cdc.gov. The uh, direct link is on the resources at the end of this presentation. What I do want to point out are the red boxes uh, in the center of the screen. Just like hepatitis B, um, hepatitis C, um, you replicate, you don't replicate. Then you can see that there's another box where the individual is replicating, not replicating virus. Um, this is important 
um, because uh, I think we've had about five incidents where we have an infant that is hep C RNA positive, but the mother is negative. And on further testing, we do get, uh, get the mom uh, where she is replicating virus and is positive. Um, also, the yellow line. Do I continue to talk? I'm going to continue to talk. Um, and so throughout the chronic illness, you can see that the ALTs um, go up and down. Um, but it's uh, in the beginning, maybe one to two months, where we may see that ALT greater than 400 for um, uh, acute infection. So with the 2012 case definition, there were two subtypes for hepatitis C, hepatitis C acute, hepatitis C past or present. Now, in CDRSS, we still use the term chronic, but with um, the new iterations that are scheduled, this subtype will be changed to past or present. We also have in CDRSS um, perinatal uh, hep C subtype. This is a placeholder for anti-hep C positive uh, infants. Um, related to maternal antibodies, which don't wane until 18 months of age. There is no LHD follow-up required. A perinatal case cannot be confirmed in CDRSS. You can um, close it out as uh, RUI, LHD closed. If no confirmatory um, hep C RNA results uh, come into the case by the time um, DOH does our annual closeout, then we may get DOH does um, uh, chronic, uh, I'm sorry, we close it as chronic, not a case, does not meet case definition. Any future positive lab results will come into the case and reopen the case and then the local health department can just uh, match the case to the mother. So the case definition of acute definition uh, of a uh, uh, acute hep C, I'm going to go over quickly. You, um, you just need a um, discrete onset of one of these signs of symptoms that are consistent with acute viral hepatitis and jaundice or uh, elevated ALT greater than 400. Now, jaundice is associated with uh, elevated total bilirubin, um, usually 2.5 or maybe 2.1 to 2.5. The point is that if we see that a total bilirubin is elevated, it's just a red flag that we can um, investigate that case further. And then you need um, what actually one or two of the confirmatory um, hepatitis C test results. And that would be the uh, signal to uh, cutoff uh, antibody test at the true positive um, result. Uh, here is the link for the uh, CDC, uh, but I also um, gave you the list. Or a positive nucleic acid testing, qualitative, quantitative genotype. If done, the person um, also has to be negative for HEP A IgM, uh, HEP B core IgM. The problem is we don't see negative results. So this is why the case definition in 2012 um, changed the language to if done. The only other way an individual can be classified as acute infection is if they have had a negative hep C antibody test within uh, the six months uh, prior to this uh, confirmatory hep C test result. This is information that you would obtain during physician interview or patient interview. Patients often say how surprised they were. They tested negative at a rehab two months ago or they were in the hospital uh, a month ago and they tested um, negative. So that would be acute infection. They're closed out as confirmed um, and LHD closed. If um, the investigation that you're doing does not meet the criteria for acute infection, then we don't make it not a case. It has to um, be looked at from the standpoint of past or present on. So in that investigation, we are looking at um, risk 
exposure risk factors six months prior to symptom onset. If there are no traditional risk factors, we need to rule out um, a health care procedure or treatment, including but not limited to a surgical procedure, dental procedure, podiatry, infusion, dialysis, sharing of glucometers or other medical supplies, colonoscopy, okay? Provide hepatitis education, that's methods of transmission. Anyone that's hep hepatitis positive should also have an alcohol intake assessment done. And the liver preservation uh, measures that I mentioned earlier would be hepatitis A, hepatitis B vaccination. So the single um, injections or the double agent twin wax combination of A and B for individuals 18 years and older. Over-the-counter and liver toxic medications should be discussed, um, you know, with their physician, any medications they take for pain, any herbs, high potent vitamins, and alcohol abstinence is uh, a must. All cases that meet the case definition for acute, once again, are closed out as subtype acute, case status confirmed, and LHD closed. Uh, now, we have said in the past that if a, if a healthcare provider um, reports on a CDS-1 or CDS-17 that this is acute infection, I want you to realize that in medicine, acute um, stands for uh, illness or diagnosis that's new to the patient with uh, the prior six months. So additional follow-up is required uh, for symptoms, ALT results, um, in order to meet the criteria for public health case definition. Once again, probable or not a case statuses are not used. Consider the past or present criteria. These are the stats for acute hepatitis C 2011, 2012, and 2013. Remember that in, in 2011, I took over hep C uh, in September. Uh, so there are 23 individuals, 25 years and younger, that I would have been able to investigate but was unable to. But of course, the board, what we see is the highest incidence of acute infection between the 26 to 49-year-olds. Not necessarily a um, case classification that we investigate. Here are the demographics. Um, you guys did a great job collecting all this data, 2011, 2012. 2013. Um, I think it's interesting the comparison between uh, male and female is pretty much the same across the board, as well as race and, and, and um, ethnicity. A difficulty with that. Um, here are the exposure risk, risk factors for 2013. Uh, 103 cases for acute hep C infection. Again, this is your data. You're the ones that collected it. Uh, IV drug use, 68% uh, of the cases um, had a history of IV drug use, so the number would be 72. Uh, unknown source, that's only eight cases, and that's individuals that denied um, any exposure risk factors, some unprotected sex. The attack twos that are listed, five cases, they were not in, um, acquired at licensed facilities. And there were four healthcare associated uh, exposures to dialysis, serial conversion, um, a serial conversion related to um, a surgical practice, and then another situation where the individual had multiple healthcare um, exposures, and um, so we're not certain where that was. Uh, the blood exposure, at the one case of blood exposure in incarceration um, was um, a behavior of in a prison that resulted in an acute infection. Um, so then we move on to the case definition for hep C, past or present. Again, in CDRSS, we label that as chronic. Most hep C infected persons are asymptomatic. They may have chronic liver disease, which can range from mild to severe. And the case definition for this is um, an individual that has a positive hep C uh, signal to cutoff uh, at the 95% predictive uh, index or a positive NAT um, 
uh, results. Now, what's in italicis is that for an infant 18 months and younger, they don't need the antibody test if there is a positive RNA um, test on an infant 18 months and older, then the infant is infected with uh, hepatitis uh, C. They usually clear the virus on their own by age one, sometimes as far out as age three. The FDA did approve uh, a combo, I think it was August uh, 2011, for a, a drug combination for children um, 3 to 18 with end-stage liver disease related to hepatitis C. That hurts my heart. Um, so with the um, case classification, uh, confirmed case once again has um, a confirmatory lab. Um, the CDC uses a case definition of probable for anyone that has um, the hepatitis C screening test and an elevated liver enzyme. Oh. And um, so we don't report them in New Jersey. But that brings me to a great collaboration with um, the Department of Health and the Division of HIV, AIDS, STD, and TB. There are five um, syringe access program, um, needle exchange sites in the state of New Jersey, one in Atlantic City, Camden, Jersey City, Newark, and Patterson. They are staffed by access to reproductive care uh, and HIV um, nurses, the acronym we use is ARCH. They are going to perform 25 rapid hep C tests monthly. They will be using CDRSS to record the positive results. They'll be closing them at the time of creation as probable LHD closed, so they will not show up on the local health department screen. They'll be able to use CDRSS to see if the person is already known to hep C uh, to um, uh, DOH as hep C positive, so they'll be um, sparing their resources, which of course are limited. They'll make a referral to the federally qualified health centers, which they do now. However, this time, confirmatory results from the FQHCs will reopen the case and the um, um, arch nurse will have access to that information and this is going to provide valuable feedback in regards to referral and access to care and treatment. Um, the testing is being piloted in Atlantic City the end of February and followed by the other four sites in March. Um, uh, with the past um, or president uh, hep C, we're getting negative serology studies. Rebecca spoke to you about this in July. Uh, at the July webinar, it's, um, the CDC uh, has requested um, that the commercial labs um, report negative hep C uh, NAT test as an indicator for viral clearing. So some things that you might see is a qualitative and quantitative um, PCR results. The value might be less than 15 UI, and it doesn't say anything else. When you click on the test, and you go into the in, in, um, interpretation statement, it says HCV RNA detected. Um, this is uh, the um, submitter of ELR um, uh, records into CDRSS. Then you might see a value of less than 15 ND. The ND stands for not detected. I'm running out of time. Um, cases created with only um, uh, not detected uh, hep C RNA results, that's happening because doctors are just doing the basic anti-EIA screening and then ordering RNAs. Some local health departments um, that investigate all their cases have followed up with the healthcare providers and have found that the individual does have um, previous diagnosis or additional confirmatory labs. Uh, then those cases are closed as uh, chronic, confirmed, recent case diagnosis in a previous year, LHD closed. Um, LHDs that have no follow-up on these should uh, close the cases as chronic, not a case, does not meet case definition, LHD closed. 
that is the only reason that we use not a case for hepatitis C case management is if the lab studies do not meet case definition. Everything else should be closed as confirmed, diagnosed in a prior year, confirmed, unable to get information from um, the healthcare provider as you're leaving. Um, hepatitis C um, signal to cutoff was 95% pre predictive value and the RNA um, negative. It could be that there's no current infection, that the uh, patient is not replicating the hep C virus at the time of the lab draw, the viral replication um, viral load might be below the lowest test assay. Many individuals still use test assay with a lower um, range of 45 or there's one in the 600s, one in the 1200s, and it could be a past hep C exposure. So they're closed as chronic confirmed LHD closed. Um, these are the chronic stats for um, 2011, 2012, 2013. Again, you can see the highest number of population is between the 26 to 49 year olds. Um, and the same thing with the demographics the ratio for male and female, and the race and ethnicity, we seem to be the same across the board. Here are the resources that I um, cited. Oh, well, one minute over. Um, so um, you do have um, the CDC link here to see that hep C serology in motion. Uh, I wanted to point out the hep C advocate uh, org at the bottom of the page. Um, this is the most up-to-date information with uh, clinical trials, latest medications, blogs, support groups, and um, research studies. I got it all in. Okay. Um, one question, Ellen. Yes. Um, someone has to add a, yes. a question. When the proposed uh, revision I'm thinking of the regulations of including the ALT, ASTs, and the total bilirubin. When will they become um, mandated? Um, well, the Chapter 57 come down in 2005, uh, 2008. So I think we're looking at 2016. Is that when the 2016, I believe, the regulations are? So whenever the new regulations are enacted, I know we're working on the uh, revisions now, but probably within another year or so. All right. Okay. Um, again, continue to enter any questions. Uh, we'll get to them at the end. Uh, based on uh, the last evaluation of one of the CD forums, people really wanted sort of more of a hot topic or an emerging issue included in these types of meetings. So uh, we chose the influenza season. It's been a busy season. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware of many long-term care uh, outbreaks related to influenza. So uh, Lisa McHugh is going to talk to us about this year's season. And uh, unfortunately, Rebecca Greeley is unable to be with us today, so Lisa will also talk about the revised uh, guidelines that were issued to control respiratory outbreaks, um, and specifically influenza in long-term care settings. So with that, Lisa. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for your attentiveness in the webinar. Um, so again, I'm going to cover some basics of the 2014-15 influenza season. Um, and then I will do my diligence to try to um, see Rebecca Greeley and, and provide as much information as I can regarding um, some of our long-term care issues that we've experienced um, in this particular flu season. So just briefly, I think many of, many of you are already quite aware of, of this particular, uh, the, the basics on flu. Um, highly contagious can range from mild to deadly. Um, each year it's estimated that somewhere between 5 and 20 percent of the United States population um, acquires uh, influenza. Um, clearly, this can uh, vary greatly during any seasonal uh, influenza season, and during pandemics can be much higher, somewhere between 25 and 50 percent. Annually, it's estimated that there's approximately 200,000 hospitalizations, um, primarily those that are occurring in young children and older adults. 36,000 people a year, it's estimated, die from influenza, and most of those occur in the elderly, the young, and those with underlying medical conditions. Flu is transmitted predominantly by droplet spread, although there has been um, some speculation that airborne spread is, is possible, especially associated with aerosol generating procedures. Um, typical incubation period is approximately two days, but can range from one to four days. With viral shedding occurring one day before symptom onset and peaking usually within the first three days of illness onset, as it correlates with the temperature. 
Um, it's usually the size at about five days with adults, so it can be as long as 10 or more days, particularly in children. People who have flu um, often feel some or all of these particular symptoms. Um, I think many of you are well aware of this, fever, feeling feverish, cough, sore throat, runny nose, stuffy nose, muscular body aches, headache, fatigue, um, and vomiting and diarrhea, which we predominantly see among children um, more so than in adults. And we clearly see much more vomiting and diarrhea in those particular viruses that are associated usually with novel viruses such as swine or avian influenza or those that have that particular component. So the pandemic strain 2009 H1N1, we did see a predominance of vomiting and diarrhea predominantly um, in children. So just a little overview on influenza viruses. Um, there are three types, type A, B, and C. Um, I'll cover C first, since it's something that we don't typically worry about. Um, human and swine are, are the known reservoir, but it causes a mild illness without seasonality. It's not usually something that we worry about. Type A infects uh, humans and a variety of other animals, including birds, pigs, and horses, um, although wild birds are the natural reservoir. And this is the greatest risk for both epidemics and pandemics. Type B, on the other hand, is uh, humans are the only known reservoir. And it's known to cause epidemics but not pandemics, predominantly because it does not change um, as significantly as it's more to data. A little bit on the anatomy of influenza viruses. Um, it's really important to know pretty much two components on this particular graphic, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase. So hemagglutinin is actually the site of the attachment of the host cells, so this is actually how the virus um, gets into healthy cells in our body. When we produce antibodies to hemagglutinin, this is actually what provides protection. And then this is actually where the vaccine um, functions, so when you get vaccine, this is, this is the target area that helps build our immunity. The second is the neuraminidase, um, sometimes you'll hear that it's called N or NA. Um, and this is the protein that helps release virus from the cells, um, essentially spreading it to other healthy cells. Um, so when our bodies create antibodies to neuraminidase, it actually helps modify disease severity. So there are 16 different hemagglutinins and 9 different neuraminidases for a potential of 144 different combinations of potential viruses at the higher level. And then clearly, within each of these combinations, there are multiple changes that can occur within the amino acid levels. Let's talk a little bit about antigenic shift and antigenic drift that's important for this particular season. So when we talk about shift, shift occurs only with type A viruses and is really a major change to a new subtype. Um, can result from the exchange of gene segments um, and can cause pandemics. So one example that is often used is H3N2 replaced by H2N2 in 1968. Thankfully for us, this particular thing occurs infrequently. Drifting, on the other hand, can occur both with influenza type A and type B viruses, and has minor changes within a particular subtype, usually because of the gradual accumulation of amino acids, either within the hemagglutinin or neuraminidase of proteins of the virus. This is actually what causes pandemics and seasonal um, epidemics each and every year, um, but can also be a problem for vaccine strains. So because viruses drift, this is why you need a new influenza vaccine each and every year. Um, so for example, there's in, in the 2003-04 season, we saw a drifting from AH3 Fujian to the H3N2 Panama. Um, and Panama was actually the vaccine strain, but it shifted. Um, and similarly, we're seeing something similar this particular season. And unfortunately for us, drifting occurs continuously um, throughout the process. So let's talk a little bit about the 2014-15 H3N2 drift. So A Texas 50 2012-like influenza virus is the current component of the 2014-15 virus. And, and A Texas is simply how um, these virus strains are named. 65% um, of the circulating H3N2 viruses tested by CDC had shown reduced titers to this particular flu vaccine strain. The current virus that's antigenically similar um, to the current circulating strain is ACE Switzerland. Um, and this H3N2 virus has been selected for the 2015 Southern Hemisphere Influenza Vaccine. Um, termination of the 15-16 vaccine strains um, for the Northern Hemisphere have not yet been made. So that's a little history on influenza A viruses. Let's turn our attention slightly to influenza B viruses. 
Um, they are subdivided into two anagenically distinct lineages, the Yamagata and Victoria lineage, but they are not characterized further into subtypes. Influenza B viruses undergo anagenic drifting less rapidly than influenza A viruses, which is often why they're less of a concern with drift. Both lineages have circulated in most recent influenza seasons, but usually one particular strain predominates. I'm going to mention briefly antivirals. Um, we've had a lot of questions um, regarding both treatment and um, prophylaxis with antivirals in the 2014-15 season. This is actually a table that's excerpted from one of the uh, professional um, antiviral uh, slides that uh, is on the CDC website. The website is at the bottom of this particular um, slide. Um, and you'll see the, the um, uh, different drugs that are available. Um, antiviral medications are effective at shortening the duration of illness if they're usually given within two days of symptom onset. Um, there are three FDA-approved antiviral drugs, also Tamivir or Tamiflu, which is in a um, pill form, the Namivir or Relenza, which is in an inhaled form, and Paramivir or Ravivab, which is an intravenous um, medication. Recommendations for treatment include uh, treatment for five days for also Tamivir or Zanamivir, Longer treatment courses uh, may be required for those who are severely ill. Um, and for treatment of uncomplicated influenza with the intravenous paramivir is um, a duration of only one day. With regard to chemoprophylaxis, there's a recommendation for a duration of seven days after the last known exposure. However, for control of outbreaks in institutional settings, such as long-term care facilities, um, where there's elderly persons or young children or in hospitals, the CDC recommends antiviral chemoprophylaxis for a minimum of two weeks and continuing for up to one week after the last known cause, after the last known case has been identified. Antiviral chemoprophylaxis is recommended for all residents, um, including those who have received influenza vaccine and for unvaccinated institutional employees. With regard to vaccination, annual vaccination is the most effective method for preventing influenza and its complications. There are currently both injectable and nasal spray products on the market, and there are also trivalent and quadrivalent vaccines on the market, meaning those that contain three different components and those that contain four different components. Uh, trivalent includes two influenza A, an H3, an H1, and one B, where the quadrivalent contains one H3, one H1, and two of the B viruses. Routine annual vaccination is recommended for all persons uh, six months and, and older, and particularly important for those with underlying medical conditions, pregnant women, and those greater than 65 years of age. I'll touch brief, briefly on some of the recent data that has come out regarding vaccine efficacy. Um, this was published on January 15, 2015, um, and it is derived from data collected from 2,321 children and adults enrolled in outpatient settings in five different study sites across the United States. These data indicate that influenza vaccination reduced a person's risk of having to go to the doctor for an influenza illness by about 23% across all ages. Um, these are compared to other um, occurrences in other flu seasons where we have seen um, the actual vaccine effectiveness be about 60% in those particular seasons. Um, I want to just caution, I, I know we get a lot of questions here about, um, you know, the vaccine's efficacy for uh, quadrivalent and high-dose vaccinations. Um, this actually study looks at all vaccinations. It doesn't differentiate between what is quadrivalent and what is high-dose. Um, so just this is a vaccine effectiveness for, for vaccines in general, regardless of the type. I want to just touch briefly on uh, influenza testing. Um, there are predominantly three different types. Um, although there are new ones being introduced into the market on a regular basis. Um, there's the rapid influenza diagnostic assay, um, which is quick and easy, um, but the accuracy of those particular tests vary. Uh, but they can be performed uh, by non-laboratorians at the bedside, and they usually give clinicians a very quick answer, although they do come with some caveats. The culture, on the other hand, is, is and has been a gold standard for many, many years. However, it's a lengthy, complex process with a very long turnaround time. It doesn't really benefit the clinician in that they can't um, produce um, quick results that would impact the, the clinical treatment of a patient. Um, PCR, however, has become quickly becoming the gold standard with a short, moderate, complex process and a short turnaround and produces a very um, reliable result. And it makes it an ideal test for both surveillance and for clinical diagnostic purposes. 
Before I move on into the um, influenza um, uh, outbreak uh, scenario, I'd like to just touch briefly on influenza parotitis. This is some link messages that have been sent out. The actual um, number of the link messages, the last bullet on this particular slide. Um, in December of 2014, CDC was notified of a diagnosis of influenza parotitis in a person with last confirmed influenza. Parotitis is thought to be a rare and uncommon complication of influenza illnesses. Um, CDC has requested states to begin to report those cases using the following case definition. A lab confirmed influenza case, um, and that could be anything from a rapid to a culture to a PCR, and a clinical diagnosis of paratitis or clinical signs and symptoms compatible with paratitis, and symptom onset on or after October 1st, 2014. We are continually in the process of collecting that information and providing it to CDC. Um, and we are um, working with the CDC on a potential case control study of those particular um, cases that, that we have um, specific pieces of data and information on. Um, and so if you have been involved in those investigations, we may be reaching out to you um, just to notify you of the participation of those cases. So now I'll move on to um, try to do my best to cover Rebecca's slides regarding prevention, investigation, and control of respiratory outbreaks in long-term care facilities. So one of the things that's really critically important is that prevention is key. And prevention is key before the outbreak occurs, not once it occurs and then you're scrambling to do your best to, to get the outbreak under control. Um, clearly, one of our best things that we can do is vaccination of all residents and all healthcare workers against influenza. Meticulous hand washing and respiratory hygiene programs, um, again, that's not just for influenza, but for many other illnesses that can occur in these settings. Regular staff and resident education. Um, signage throughout the building for visitors, particularly at the beginning of influenza season and throughout the influenza season. And then timely identification of initial cases so that we can stop the outbreak before it spreads any further. Many of you are already familiar with the uh, mandates regarding reporting. Long-term care facilities and other institutions are required to immediately report any known or suspect cases of communicable disease and outbreaks um, of all diseases and report them to the local health department. Um, Long-term care facilities are also required to notify long-term care licensing. Um, we do have a reciprocal agreement with long-term care licensing, as many of these facilities think that when they call the department that they're calling communicable disease, and in reality they are calling licensing. So we do have a reciprocal notification agreement with licensing for facilities that call directly to them, but do not report to their local health department or the state health department. Um, local health departments notify NJDOH of, of those outbreaks, and then state facilities are immediately reportable to the department as well. So these are general guidelines that are in, in the new um, outbreak uh, notification protocol. Um, so you may have an outbreak occurring if several residents who exhibit similar respiratory symptoms in the same room, same wing of a facility, or have attended some type of common activity. Two or more residents develop respiratory illness within 72 hours of each other. Or there's an increase in employee absences, with many of the staff reporting similar symptoms. A facility's reporting responsibility is to identify the initial outbreak and provide that report to the local health department. This would include things like the number of residents and staff, signs and symptoms, including the onset and duration, location within the facility, testing conducted to date, and outcomes, whether the individuals were hospitalized or had died. Um, the facility should be providing daily updates to the local health department, and the local health department should be in consult with the New Jersey Department of Health. The facility should not wait to collect all of this information before reporting, and should immediately begin using a line list to track this information on any cases that occur. In the big, early in 2015, the outbreak pre prevention and control guidelines for respiratory infections were revised. Um, and they were established to facilitate the investigation and control of respiratory disease outbreaks and to emphasize the priorities regarding outbreak control, both detection, agent identification, and control of those facilities. We all also have additional outbreak control guidelines for gastrointestinal infections and also a recently published one on TB. And the website at the bottom is there to um, uh, guide you to where you can locate those documents for further review. So here's a list of the steps in an outbreak investigation, and I'm not going to read all of these. Um, and they don't always occur in the same order, but each one of these things should be reviewed and identified to see if they're needed uh, in the course of an outbreak to continue with an investigation. So the first 
step is to confirm that an outbreak exists. Well, when we look at respiratory virus outbreaks in a long-term care setting, this is what we talk about when we, we think of a confirmed outbreak. One lab confirms a positive case of influenza or RC or adenovirus in a resident, along with other cases of respiratory illness on that particular unit is a confirmed outbreak, or a sudden increase over the normal background rate of acute respiratory illness, or ARI, with or without documented fever, um, which is a temperature of greater than 100 or two degrees above the established baseline. ARI includes any of the two of the following symptoms, including fever, sore throat, cough, rhinorrhea, nasal congestion in the absence of another known cause, potential seasonal allergies, or COPD. Please note that this is not 10% of the population must be sick in order to confirm an outbreak. Often when we get to that 10% point, it's very difficult to put in any type of control measures to prevent additional spread within that facility. It should also be noted that elderly and me uh, medically fragile persons may, not mani may manifest atypical signs of respiratory viral illness and may not always present with, with fever. So next would be to verify the diagnosis. Determine the cause of the illness um, and the need to and when you're doing that, you need to consider both the patient's history, the clinical presentation, and laboratory findings. Was influenza testing conducted? What type of test was conducted? Was there other non-influenza testing conducted, both viral and bacterial? Um, was there respiratory virus panel run? Were there blood cultures to determine if another bacterial illness was associated? After a single laboratory confirmed case, it should be likely suspected that the subsequent cases associated with those respiratory illnesses that are similar, um, similar with signs and symptoms are actually caused by that same organism. The next step would be to develop a, a case definition we would, we would work with public health to develop that case definition, and it's used to define a criteria when an individual should or should not be included as an outbreak case. This can help uh, be established by using person, place, time, and clinical conditions. An example of a case definition that might be used in a long-term care facility outbreak would be laboratory evidence of a respiratory pathogen, such as influenza, in a resident or staff member of unit XYZ on or after a specific date with at least one symptom or sign compatible with that particular respiratory infection. And your regional epidemiologist or your subject matter expert that you're dealing with here can always help you develop that case definition and hone in the cases that you're looking for as, as part of that outbreak. It's important to perform active surveillance and seek additional cases. Please remember that you may not be looking for new cases. You may have to go back in time and look for cases which have previously occurred. This should include both residents and staff. And clearly, you should be alert for new onsets um, of illness among those exposed. Um, you need to review resident and staff histories to identify previous onsets of illness um, that could have been part of this particular outbreak. It's important to document and count cases. Um, the facility should um, be given the line listing. We have a sample line list that's available that can be modified um, for use in these particular settings and can help track cases that are part of the outbreak can develop, be help you to develop line lists to see um, if your outbreak control measures are actually working. So it's not only a case tracking tool, but it ensures consistent data collection, helps us summarize some of the descriptive epidemiology, such as gender and age, symptoms, location status within the facility. It also serves in a, as an assessment for the outbreak and the um, need to change or alter the recommendations for control measures that are being implemented. So this is just an example of the line list that's being set um, currently up on the website um, and can be modified um, to uh, meet the needs that you might have for any particular outbreak. An epidemic curve. An epidemic curve is a graphical, graphical representation of the outbreak um, in which the date of the onset is on the x-axis and the number of cases is on the y-axis and is usually created from the line list. An epidemic curve can provide information on the magnitude of the outbreak, the pattern of the transmission, exposure and or incubation period, and critically, the effectiveness of the control measures. So this is an example of a Salmonella Alberta um, epi curve, where you see case patients by date of onset or specimen collection and the reporting agency. Um, this is from 2004. And so you can see, just by plotting, occurring throughout the month of July, and once an identification of, of the source and removal of that product, you can see a significant dwindling off of those particular cases. 
It's critical to identify and elim eliminate possible transmission sources, study the line list and the epi care for patterns, what factors do these cases share, medical or therapy equipment, eating facilities, environmental exposures, or care providers, and then modify these factors, um, at least those that can be controlled. This would include the exclusion of sick staff members, monitoring personnel for absenteeism, posting signage for visitors, and informing receiving facilities of outbreaks when, when patients are transferred. Institute control measures. Control measures can include some of the following, including cohorting, antiviral precautions, such as standard precautions and drop of precautions, hand hygiene, education, and visitor restrictions. And in the next few slides, I'll go into some detail of these particular items. As far as cohorting is concerned, there's particularly a way to identify three cohort groups, those that are ill, those that are exposed, essentially not ill but potentially incubating, and those that are not ill and not exposed. This could include new admissions and staff as well. You need to restrict the use of equipment and supplies to those within the specific area and not allow residents or staff from one cohort to mix with the other. So for example, we might suspend community dining or recreational activities where ill and well would otherwise intermingle. We would close the facility to new admissions if the physical setup does not allow for a complete segregation between the non-ill, not exposed and ill exposed cohorts. Symptomatic residents should remain in their assigned room until 24 hours after fever and respiratory signs and symptoms have resolved. And the staff assigned to the affected units should not rotate to the unaffected units until the local health department has determined that the outbreak is under control. This restriction includes prohibiting staff from working on unaffected units after completing their usual shift in the affected units. Antivirals should be utilized as indicated, and I mentioned this previously when I showed the antiviral slides. Treatment, um, all long-term care facilities, um, residents who are confirmed or have suspected influenza should receive antiviral treatment immediately. With regard to prophylaxis, all eligible residents in the entire long-term care facility, not just those in the impacted units, should receive antiviral chemoprophylaxis as soon as the influenza outbreak is determined. Um, facilities should consider standing orders for antivirals um, to expedite this process um, during, during um, outbreak time. Um, and that way there's not a delay in trying to get um, standing orders from each of the physicians that are, are, are available. With regard to education, um, you should provide mandatory in-service to all staff on all shifts. Discuss the sources of transmission, and the spread, and the control of the disease. And also emphasize precautions and hand hygiene. Um, we also have many developed educational materials that can be used to assist in some of these education and training. With regard to environmental cleaning, you should use routine uh, cleaning and disinfectant strategies during the influenza season and throughout the season. Um, focus on cleaning frequently touched surfaces in common areas and residents' rooms. Special handling of soil, linens, and dietary trays is not necessary. Um, and you can always refer to the list of uh, registered disinfectants in the, in, on the EPA. And always the, the, the great question of periods have passed without, being, uh, without a new case being identified. Usually waiting two incubation periods allow for the recognition of potentially secondary case patients that are still asymptomatic but in whom the disease may still be incubating. For influenza, two incubation periods is approximately one week. So the evaluation of those control measures, again, can be readily done using the EPI curve. Um, so here you can see um, an EPI curve um, where control measures were implemented um, at the orange hash line, and you can see the significant reduction in cases occurring. This is often the case of what we see in long-term care outbreaks as soon as um, implementation of uh, control measures are put into place there's a sharp decline in um, the number of cases that occur. And usually within about a week of that, we can actually determine that the outbreak is considered over. So once an outbreak is over, there is a final summary report um, in which you should summarize the investigation in writing. Um, and in the particular case of long-term care outbreaks, there, are, there is an outbreak summary form, the CDS 30, um, which is readily available from the websites that are posted here. Okay. Um, thanks, Lisa. We have several questions on um, on flu. Um, we have one comment saying that uh, 
what people are finding is happening with um, all outbreaks, I guess not just respiratory, is uh, certain long-term care facilities are reporting uh, late due to, um, I guess, not wanting to draw attention to the fact that they have an ongoing outbreak. And, and that often occurs, um, and, and that's why we would, would highly stress that um, we get in before the flu season starts and not when these outbreaks occur and try to encourage long-term care facilities um, to put in place prevention measures before those outbreaks occur, let them know that we're there to assist um, in these outbreaks. Um, and even once an outbreak um, has, has been um, significantly run through the facility, it is important to review with them what those, the appropriate control measures are um, and to continue to enforce those control measures um, and, and put them in place because um, even if there are several cases that have already occurred, there may be many, many other cases with significant underlying complications who can benefit from treatment under prophylaxis within that facility. Um, can you clarify the testing recommended if flu is suspected? Should PCR be done as soon as flu is suspected, or is a rapid test the best for an immediate result? Um, PCR um, is actually the, the best um, laboratory test that can be done um, in most of these scenarios. However, it's not always feasible to have that done. Um, if there is a rapid influenza test that is available in those facilities, either through their commercial lab partner or right directly within the facilities, certainly that is something that we would work to, um, to help you with. Um, it, it, I don't want to discourage the use of rapid test results because I think that they do have their, their place, um, but certainly it's always helpful if we do have a rapid influenza positive, we can work with you to try to get that specimen confirmed to the state public health lab or the commercial lab that the um, long-term care facility has a vendor in. In any particular case, regardless of whether it's a rapid test result or a PCR test result, if they're positive and there's other residents within that facility that have respiratory illnesses, it would be considered a confirmed outbreak and we would recommend control measures be put in place. Okay. Um, question on what the recommendations are regarding pregnancy and flu vaccine and is it safe to receive the flu vaccine in all trimesters? Yes. Um, flu vaccine um, is highly encouraged for those uh, women who will be pregnant throughout the influenza season, and it is safe um, to provide influenza vaccine um, during all trimesters. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, another question on the quadrivalent vaccine. Um, if there is a quadrivalent vaccine now available, why isn't the trivalent vaccine uh, basically phased out? Um, I, I think eventually that probably will happen. Um, again, why different manufacturers produce um, different vaccines is not something that we really, um, we definitely, we, we really know. So I, I think eventually that will happen. Um, it's a relatively new vaccine, and so um, I, again, I think it probably will happen. Okay. Um, and another question about uh, the high dose vaccine. We actually had two questions about this. Um, one is there data showing increased effectiveness compared to the standard dose vaccine? And then separately, uh, a question between the high-dose vaccine and the quadrivalent vaccine and which would be preferred. And, and again, I, I think that this is something that um, I know the um, ACIP um, group that needs to discuss um, recommendations for vaccinations has been um, discussing as of late. Um, the current recommendation is that any flu vaccine, regardless of the type of vaccine, is critical. Um, uh, is a critical recommendation. They do not differentiate between the recommendation of high dose or quadrivalent or trivalent vaccine. Um, the study that I showed you was talking about vaccine efficacy. Many of the studies that are out there that are published regarding the high dose vaccine and the um, uh, quadrivalent vaccines are actually randomized control trials. They are not um, real world um, data that's produced such as, as what I showed in these vaccine efficacy studies, which are actually done in the real population. Um, and so until we can actually get some of those real-world vaccine efficacy studies done, um, it's really difficult for us to say that there's recommendations of one over the other. Um, clearly, there are certain groups that can benefit from some of these other vaccinations. The high-dose vaccine is recommended for those um, in the older age groups. Um, there also is a recommendation for live attenuated um, vaccine um, uh, in a preference group of uh, children two to eight years of age um, are preferred. And I'm, I'm questioning myself on the actual age range, but it is posted on the CDC website in two to eight, two to eight years of age, um, preferentially to get the, um, the nasal spray vaccine. 
Um, so I think uh, over the course of time, we will eventually learn um, additional information about many of these other vaccines. It's just going to take some time for us to get some of those real-world studies done. Uh, you had mentioned that a flu culture is uh, time-consuming. Do you have a, an approximate turnaround time for how long that takes? An influenza culture um, to actually call a negative and negative can sometimes um, take up to set between seven and ten days. Um, a positive flu culture can grow out in as little as three days. Um, but again, if it's not positive, sometimes you have to wait seven to ten days to actually call it negative. And there's very, very few laboratories um, who conduct uh, viral culture for influenza. Um, one person had a comment that in long-term care outbreaks that they were working on, uh, residents were uh, received chemoprophylaxis for uh, seven days and not the recommended two weeks. Can you address that? Um, we had heard that there were some um, significant discrepancies in what um, providers were giving as far as recommendations. That is why we tried to go out with several links messages um, to reiterate what the actual recommendations were. Um, so again, if you're dealing with these outbreaks, I highly encourage you to review the documentation on the CDC website and in some of the messages that we sent out to ensure that the recommendations that are being made to these facilities um, is appropriate and that the providers who are um, conducting the uh, standing orders or, or prescribing these for these patients are aware of what the prophylaxis doses is. Um, we actually we know that we've, we had um, some reports of some mixing up the treatment and prophylactic doses. Um, and so that's why we tried to get out some messaging in the hopes that that would help you um, work with these facilities in getting the providers to provide the appropriate um, dosage for both treatment and prophylaxis. Um, following up on antivirals, uh, the guidelines are recommended for nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Can you, um, how do assisted living facilities fit into that? Um, since they often don't have a medical director, the decision to provide uh, prophylaxis is up to individual physicians. Um, staff may not be getting vaccinated either or treatment. That's a great question. And in all of those cases, um, they do fall under the same um, guideline and we would make the same recommendation in those assisted living facilities. And we know that sometimes this can be, um, can be problematic because they don't always have a solitary medical director that provides oversight to the entire facility. But in large part, many of these facility facilities, um, the residents of these facilities do have their own medical providers. And in those particular cases, um, we would need to reach out to each of those medical providers to provide the treatment and prophylaxis for those residents. And we realize that that can be very difficult, which is why we would certainly recommend um, that these discussions be had prior to an influenza season, that standing orders can be provided um, ahead of time um, so that should these things occur, um, the standing orders can be initiated um, well, in, well in advance uh, when an outbreak actually does occur. Okay. Um, we do have a couple more questions, but I'm going to defer them to the question and answer session at the end. So with that, we're going to move into the CDS program updates, the least three, and uh, I'll let them introduce themselves, but I'll start off by introducing uh, Elizabeth Zarensky, and she's going to be providing an um, update on vaccine-preventable diseases. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to, as usual, talk very quickly to get through these slides in the allotted time. Um, some additional information has come up in the last couple of days, so I added them and have less time. Um, just want to make you aware that the, um, the case definition for meningococcal disease has changed. Um, the revised CSTE case definition for meningococcal disease, approved and effective for 2015, now includes PCR positive cases as confirmed cases, as opposed to the previously classified probable. The provision was based on significant improvements in both quality of uh, PCR and the assays used for the detection of bacteria meningitis. PCR assays are also now available to detect six of the meningococcal serogroups, including all of the major serogroups which cause disease in the U.S., A, B, C, Y, and W135. Surveillance for meningococcal disease is needed to monitor trends in disease incidence, changes in epidemiology, and serogroup distribution, and the effect of vaccination on the incidence of disease. You can access the new meningococcal disease case definition via the link on your slide and additional information on meningococcal disease on our website also via the, slide, the link on your slide. Similarly, for H. flu, there is a recently developed and validated species-specific PCR assay capable of detecting all six serotypes for homophilus influenzae, A through F and non typable with high sensitivity and specificity. Therefore, PCR-positive cases will also be classified as confirmed. 
As the epidural invasive of H. flu disease in the U.S. Uh, has shifted, it is important to monitor specimens for both B and non-B serotypes so that cases of invasive H. flu disease are appropriately identified and classified in national burden estimates. With the increased reliability of PCR and its ability to detect not only homophilic influenza, but a serotype, um, classifying PCR positive cases as confirmed, accurately describes public health confidence in PCR as a reliable H. flu site are on your slide. Uh, let's see here. Just a quick update regarding the mumps outbreak affecting the National Hockey League and the American Hockey League. As of last week, 36 mumps cases have been identified as associated with eight teams and officials. This number has uh, been decreased from the total originally reported as CDC has obtained additional information on those cases and was better able to classify them. Currently, parasitis onset dates currently range from October 19, 2014 to January 14, 2015. New Jersey Department of Health is aware of um, four devil's players that were diagnosed with mumps. One of those does not reside in New Jersey, and a different jurisdiction was following up with them. Two additional devil's players were reported in the news as having had mumps, but despite extreme efforts on the local level, the cases were not able to be investigated. The case, cases were never reported by providers to New Jersey, and we do not know where they sought treatment or testing. We also do not know if they reside in another state and may be investigated elsewhere. Only because they were reported in the news did we have their names. And I just want to give a very big thank you to the local health departments that worked really hard trying to get info on those two cases. So now I want to switch to the hot topic, measles. As you're all aware, the U.S. is currently experiencing an outbreak of measles. To date, from January 1 through February 6, 121 cases have been reported in 17 states and Washington, D.C. California. We have this information on our measles website. Um, we will not be updating the numbers every Monday as CDC is attempting to do, but there is a link to CDC's data from our page so you can easily access the most up-to-date numbers. New Jersey does have one confirmed case in a one-year-old unvaccinated child. Unfortunately, there was delayed reporting by the provider, which put us very behind for public health response. The child's rash onset was 113, and uh, they saw the, a doctor on 114. We were notified of the positive lab result via electronic lab reporting from LabCorp on 23. The doctor managed uh, the exposures that occurred in the office, and the local health department notified the building where the child lives there were reportedly no other potential exposures. The incubation period did end on 2-7, and to date there are no secondary cases associated with this child. We have guidance on specimen collecting and uh, testing on our website and what to do if there's an exposure, so please visit the website at the bottom of your slide. I just want to quickly review what to do if you receive a report of suspect measles. Most of you are familiar with this info and nothing has changed, but it's always good to just do a quick review. <clears throat> the first thing is to try to decide how likely it is that the person has measles by verifying the diagnosis and conducting a thorough interview with the healthcare provider as well as the patient or the patient's family. With the U.S. outbreak, we are receiving a severe increase of reports of suspect measles, and there are other rash illnesses occurring out there. So we want to try to verify the diagnosis and collect some epi info that will be helpful. We will request a clear description of the patient's symptoms. We want to know what the rash looked like and what the progression was. Did it start at the hairline and the face and work its way downward and outward? Uh, and we would expect the rash to recede in the same way. Do they have cough, coryza, or conjunctivitis? Do they have a fever? What is the temperature? Are there any other symptoms? Along with these symptoms, we will request an accurate onset date for each. Sometimes the order in which symptoms appear can help us decide on how likely a measles diagnosis is. Also, the correct onset date for rash impacts public health response and it's how we decide who is exposed, what post-exposure prophylaxis is appropriate for a given exposure group, how long a patient must be isolated, and when the incubation period will end. Is there any alternate explanation for the symptoms? Could it be another disease like parvo, entero, strep, or mono? Did the patient take any um, antibiotics recently or any chemotherapy, say within the last two weeks or so? What is the name of the medicine that the patient has been taken, taking and what dates were they taken? Are, have they had any exposure to new perfumes, soaps, or food? 
does a patient, does a person travel internationally or even domestically, for example, California or New York City, uh, during their incubation period? Where have they been in the three weeks before their illness? Did they go anywhere that measles is known to be occurring? Have they had any visitors during that same time period? Any exposure to known ill persons? Are they vaccinated? Please try to obtain MMR dates or a copy of their serologic proof of immunity. For specimen collection, you can find two helpful documents on our website, a measles laboratory FAQ and a quick guide for measles specimen collection and testing. Please take a look at these documents on our website. Serology can be sent to a commercial laboratory but we would like viral specimens sent to our state laboratory with our approval for submission to CDC. A patient suspected of having measles should not be sent to a commercial laboratory site. This could expose many more people. Generally, blood collected within 72 hours of rash on that may be difficult to interpret, so there's no harm in waiting until the patient is no longer infectious to send them to one of those facilities. We would prefer viral specimens collected as soon as possible after rash onset and that can be done wherever the patient is actually being evaluated. Okay, so on to contact tracing. Once you have an accurate rash onset, calculate the infectious period, which is four days before the rash onset through four days after the rash onset. That's a total of nine days. If the rash onset, for example, was on January 13th, we would calculate the infectious period to be January 9 through January 17th. Work with the patient and or their family to obtain the to obtain a complete list of where the patient has been while infectious. Please request the location name, the address, the date they were there, and the time. And it's important to get the arrival time and the departure time. Then, once you know who was exposed, you, can meet, you will need to determine their immune status and whether post-exposure proceeds is appropriate. Exposed persons will need to be notified of the exposure, excluded if they have no or unknown immunity. Please work with us on this before excluding anyone. They need to be educated on signs and symptoms of measles and informed what to do if they become symptomatic. They should be calling their health care provider before going to the provider's office and let them know that they have been exposed to measles and are now symptomatic. This will allow the providers to make arrangements to prevent new exposures. Then follow up at the end of the incubation period to make sure that they remain asymptomatic. Um, at the state, we're using a, um, a triage type sheet that's in a draft format I'm going to ask the regional EPIs to try and send it out to um, some of their local health department contacts, and you can also request it from us. It's not meant to be a full investigation form, but it does include some of these items that I just mentioned, and it may be helpful when you're taking reports of, um, of suspect cases. So we're going to be sending that out. We just need to tweak it a little bit. Um, so it'll either be this afternoon or tomorrow that they'll be sending this out. And if you don't receive it, please reach out to us, and we'll send you a copy. Again, it's not an official form, but you might find it helpful. We've also received a lot of questions from schools on how they can prepare for potential exposure. You may also be receiving uh, these questions. I just want to quickly go over what um, we've been saying to them. Schools should be reviewing their student vaccine records and exemption lists and know who has no proof of immunity, either no MMR or no serologic proof of immunity. If a student has an exemption, please make sure that it's actually for the MMR and not just for another vaccine, for example, flu vaccine. If there are students without MMR, the school nurse may want to consider speaking with the parents to encourage them to bring the child up to date, considering the recent needles outbreak and the recent mumps outbreaks that we've been experiencing, um, and just let them know that the child would be excluded if the case occurs in the school. We have found that um, some children who were originally exempt from MMR may have been because the parent wanted to delay it, and actually now that the child is older, the parents would be okay with it. However, um, no one has ever revisited the topic. So if the school nurse is comfortable, depending on their population, um, discussing this with the parents, then, then that would be great. But it all depends on the population for each individual school. Okay, so the students are easy. Uh, the school nurses, we would also suggest that they start conversations with their staff members about their measles immunity and whether they have documented MMR or serologic proof of immunity. And this is for all staff, not just teachers. If an exposure occurs, Anyone without proof of immunity to measles will be excluded. So starting the conversations early will hopefully avoid having any school staff excluded for any amount of time. It's important to remind students and staff not to come to uh, school or work while ill. Um, encourage the schools to get to know you. Um, 
at the local health department. If they have an exposure, they're going to be working very closely with you. If an exposure occurs, please verify that an exposure actually did, in fact, occur. Was the ill person actually in school at the time while infectious? If so, what were the first and last days the ill person was in that school? Persons with no or unknown measles immunity should be excluded. The school should do this only in consultation with the local health department and with the state. Uh, you will notify parents and staff of the exposure, again, in consultation with the local health department and the state. No messaging should be distributed without your knowledge on the local level, and this is just to ensure that accurate information is provided. Please obtain a copy of the communication that they intend to distribute and provide one to us, too. This way, all parties are on the same page and can respond to inquiries appropriately with the same information. It's really important to maintain the one voice, one message. Hopefully, you'll find this helpful for um, if you get any inquiries from schools. And that's up, it for my update. Um, Liz, did you or Barb want to mention the 317 funding? This is Barbara. If there's anyone out there who is a 317 adult vaccine provider and uh, you're interested in doing some sort of proactive um, measles vaccination, let us know. The CDC is trying to make it easier to um, get people vaccinated, so they've loosened their requirements for the 317 vaccine somewhat in terms of the insurance of the individuals. So if there's a mass vaccination campaign for measles, uh, there would be less of an intense requirement for scrutinizing individuals for insurance. So let us know if you're interested in doing anything proactively for measles vaccination. We may be able to help you. Okay. Um, all right, with that, uh, we're going to turn it over to Michelle Malavay, and she's going to talk a little bit about some uh, foodborne disease issues. Good morning. Um, I would say that it's nice to see you today, but I can't see you. So I'm just going to have to trust that you're out there and that you look marvelous today. Um, I have a few updates that I'd like to share with you this morning. Uh, if you take a look at the first slide, I summarized the uh, foodborne outbreaks and clusters that we had in New Jersey last year, 2014. We had approximately 12 outbreaks associated with local restaurants. Three of those were salmonella, one was campy, seven were norovirus, either confirmed or suspected, and one was scumboard poisoning. We also had five mushroom poisoning outbreaks. Um, Wild mushrooms seem to be uh, the hot item last year, especially in the early uh, fall. We had two in-state clusters of salmonellosis, and we worked on 32 multi-state clusters of salmonellosis under investigation by CDC and state and local health departments. Just one other item I'd like to talk to you about this morning. Um, we had chatted last time about some new forms for foodborne disease investigation. These forms are, have been completed. They're on the website. There are revised interview forms for your use on salmonellosis, shigellosis, campylobacter, uh, and shigatoxin fusion E. coli. There's also one-page guidance on procedures for investigating each of these foodborne diseases. So if you take a look at the page for the individual disease, you will see those forms and that guidance. So I encourage you to take a look at it. I hope it makes your life easier um, and you can report and do a better investigation on your end. So I appreciate you, you using that. Um, last year, we had a sort of an interesting neurovirus outbreak associated with a local restaurant. Uh, this outbreak, we believe, was associated with environmental contamination in the restaurant and it's actually not a food product. Um, Julia Wells is one of our regional epidemiologists here, and she worked with the local health department on this investigation. I'd like to turn this over to Julia right now and have her sort of go over quickly the, um, the outbreak, because I think it's an interesting learning experience. Julia? All right. Thank you, Michelle. All right. So, um, Often when we investigate enteric disease, um, you know, whether it's just a few suspicious cases or we've identified an outbreak and we can't seem to make that outbreak end, uh, you know, we fall into the habit of immediately declaring it a foodborne outbreak and investigating as such, you know, from initial report of the outbreak. Um, this isn't without scientific basis, as many of the more enteric diseases are commonly acquired through the consumption of contaminated food products. 
Um, however, late last year, the, uh, the outbreak that Michelle is referring to, one of our local health departments worked on an outbreak um, associated with a restaurant where this was not the most likely mechanism. Uh, this is a large restaurant. It has multiple dining rooms to accommodate private parties while regular food service is going on in the main dining room. So at the end of a private birthday party in one of these uh, ancillary dining rooms, a young girl started feeling ill, um, probably tried to make it to the bathroom but couldn't quite make it, uh, and vomited on the side of that dining room. Um, we believe she likely also became sick again afterwards in that adjacent bathroom, uh, but we, we were never able to completely confirm that. Um, two staff members uh, you know, were I, I, um, identified by the, uh, the mother of the child, and they helped to clean up that vomitus at the end of the night. Um, so over the next week or so, uh, the local health department received calls from attendees of three other parties that had been held at this restaurant. All were complaining of acute gastrointestinal illness occurring approximately 12 to 48 hours after having attended a party at this restaurant. The local health department was also notified that, in, that the two employees that cleaned the vomitus from the birthday party attendee had both become sick. So I think the natural assumption here is to think that these employees perpetuated person-to-person -person transmission and or that they contaminated food product, uh, food prep services, or dishware. However, these employees did not work after their exposure to the ill, uh, the Ill party goer. Uh, and you know, they, they just weren't scheduled to continue work. Uh, they became ill while they were off schedule, and they remained ho home for an appropriate uh, exclusion period after becoming sick. So during the in initial investigation, the local health department uh, had sent an RHS out to the restaurant where they were assured that appropriate disinfection had occurred after the child got sick. However, uh, continued surveillance by the local health department and investigation uh, it revealed that all the subsequent cases of acute gastrointestinal illness had attended a party held in the same room where the index case vomited nearly a week beforehand. So all of these people that were calling the local health department complaining of illness and identifying this restaurant all, uh, all went to parties that were conducted in the same room where the, uh, the child had gotten sick. Uh, one actually noted uh, when they came to the room to prepare for the party that they could smell vomit and the restaurant attempt to do some surface cleaning to, you know, to appease the customer. Um, so what I want you to take home from this case example, um, you know, is to kind of keep your mind open to all methods of transmission when you're investigating an outbreak, and especially when you're implementing control measures. Uh, make sure that you are instructing a facility to institute precautions that address both people and the potential for person-to-person -person transmission and their environment. Uh, this is particularly important when you're dealing with an agent like norovirus, which has such a low infectious dose and causes symptoms that can result in gross contamination of surfaces in a large radius around the obvious spill. Um, we have evidence to believe that vomit can travel 10 to 15 feet uh, you know, from where you would normally indicate that someone's vomiting um, and can contaminate surfaces. But that, those surfaces usually do not get properly cleaned. Um, so in most circumstances, this will mean, from the perspective of the local, of the local health department, uh, being very explicit when you're talking to any type of facility about the methods and products used for environmental disinfection and also appropriate PPE for the people doing that cleaning. Uh, in this case, the RHS went back out to the restaurant and directly observed cleaning and sanitizing of the implicated areas, and no additional cases were identified or reported afterwards. Um, and so if you are also, if you are leaving public health to open a restaurant, I would advise that you not put carpet in the dining room. That's my <laughs> last thought on that. Um, so if you have any questions uh, about this update, you can type them into the question box and we'll address them at the end. Um, and with that, enjoy the next update from Shereen Semple. Oh, yeah, actually, before we move on real quick, uh, just a question on the interview forms, Michelle, and um, is it still okay to use the out, um, the older form uh, that has uh, additional detail? Um, this is Michelle. Certainly, yes. If, if you use the old uh, salmonella, salmonella form, um, it's a little more extensive. It asks more questions. That'd be great. Um, you know, whatever you're comfortable with is fine. So that definitely provides the uh, an adequate amount of information for us. Alrighty, hello everybody. Shereen here. Um, 
So unfortunately, the outbreak of Ebola virus disease, or EVD, is still continuing, despite what seems to be a lull in media coverage. The chart here shows the case counts for the three countries with widespread and intense transmission, including Liberia in red, Sierra Leone in green, and Guinea along the x-axis in blue. To date, there have been almost 22,500 reported cases of EVD and 9,000 deaths in these three countries. At the start of the new year in January, all three countries reported a plateau in new cases, and folks were hoping this would signal a turning point in the outbreak. Unfortunately, in the first week in February, the WHO reported that case incidents increased in all three countries for the first time this year. Epidemiologically, a stratified analysis shows that the number of cases in males and females is similar. Compared with children, as defined as 14 years and under, people aged 15 to 44 are approximately three times more likely to be affected, and people aged 45 and over are almost 45, uh, four times more likely to be affected. Of the total case counts, 822 confirmed healthcare worker infections have been reported, including 488 reported deaths. This rise in incidence and number of cases among healthcare workers shows that the EVD response still faces significant challenges. Community resistance continues to be an issue. For example, in early February, Guinea reported 39 new cases of EVD. 11 of these confirmed cases were linked to an unsafe burial that took place in January. And as the wet season approaches, there is an urgent need to end the outbreak in as wide an area as possible, especially in remote areas that will become more difficult to access. Here in the U.S., EVD preparedness and response efforts continue. In addition to things like hospital preparedness, PPE training and stockpile, and other community planning and logistics, states have been engaged in active and direct active monitoring of persons traveling from one of the countries with widespread transmission. As of February 3rd, a total of 7,767 persons were screened at one of the five U.S. airports receiving flights from EVD-affected countries. Of the over 7,000 persons being screened, 13 were referred for immediate medical evaluation. Three of those were in New Jersey. Of the over 7,000 persons being screened for EVD, 577 were referred for additional risk evaluation or tertiary screening by CDC personnel. 80 of those interviews took place at Newark Liberty International Airport. It's important to note, persons who undergo additional evaluation by DGMQ are not necessarily classified as high risk or even subject to quarantine in our state. Many of these 80 persons undergoing additional screening in Newark were either cleared as having low risk or had some risk for EVD but we're traveling to a connecting flight and not staying in New Jersey. Overall, looking at the travelers returning to the U.S. from EVD-affected countries, New Jersey ranks as the fifth most common destination, receiving 5% of the total cohort of persons returning to or visiting the U.S. The more common destinations of these travelers include New York, Maryland, Georgia, and Pennsylvania. For more information on levels of risk, related movement and monitoring guidelines, and enhanced entry screening at U.S. airports, please refer to the CDC and New Jersey Department of Health Ebola website. Most of you listening to this call have been involved in active monitoring, direct active monitoring, or the evaluation of a person under investigation for Ebola, also called a PUI. I want to take a moment to thank you. The work that is being done by local health departments in New Jersey is truly astounding, and we very much appreciate the labor-intensive planning and response that has occurred and continues to occur at the local level. To date, 423 asymptomatic persons with low risk for EVD have been actively monitored in New Jersey since active monitoring began in late October. Again, nationally, this number was well over 7,500, with New Jersey conducting active monitoring on a little over 5% of that national total. Looking at data from CDRSS, we have anywhere from 49 to 99 persons under active monitoring at the start of each week. Since our EVD response and surveillance efforts began in August, we've performed direct active monitoring on seven asymptomatic persons with some risk of EVD in four counties, where the local health department has conducted twice daily checks with the affected traveler. Since early August, 
we've issued a total of eight quarantine orders for persons with some risk of EBD, although this number does not necessarily reflect the number of persons quarantined in home. So for example, a person identified with an elevated risk of EBD during screening at the airport who is traveling by car to a neighboring state may receive a quarantine order only covering the duration of time it takes to get to the border. In addition to asymptomatic persons with low risk who are under active monitoring, we carefully monitor persons who may be symptomatic for EBD or PUIs. To date, New Jersey has had 18 PUIs requiring evaluation at a frontline or assessment facility. The counties listed under the PUI number on this slide reflect both the county of residence or the county where the hospital is located. As such, Essex has the highest frequency given the higher number of PUIs identified during airport screening and evaluation at University Hospital in Newark. Note, of these 18 PUIs, only one was tested for Ebola. By and large, the vast majority of PUIs are diagnosed with other, more common traveler-related or seasonal diagnoses such as malaria, influenza, or traveler's diarrhea. Nationally, there have been 847 PUIs identified, with 95 persons tested for Ebola and four confirmed cases. New Jersey remains at zero cases of EBD. At this time, I'd like to bring your attention to some new resources that have been posted. On the CDC website, there are several documents that have been added in the past month including recommendations for influenza vaccine and post-exposure chemoprophylaxis in persons under active monitoring, questions and answers on the safe EMS transport of pediatric patients with possible EBD, guidance for U.S. labs handling clinical specimens for persons with suspect or confirmed EBD, guidance for U.S. hospitals and mortuaries handling human remains for persons with confirmed EBD, recommendations for students and faculty traveling to West Africa for educational purposes, and interim guidance for cargo ships and persons with suspected EBD. Of note, in regards to the document describing influenza vaccine in persons under active monitoring, the CDC is recommending states ascertain whether persons under active monitoring have received a flu shot, and for those persons staying in areas where influenza may be circulating, recommend the influenza vaccine. As such, we are adding a question to the risk assessment in CDRSF for local health departments to ask during the initial consultation with a person under active monitoring to see if they've received their flu shot. If they have not, and they are staying in the New Jersey, New York area, we suggest you recommend they consider getting the vaccine. It is not mandatory that a person gets vaccinated. In addition, we ask that for persons who are under active monitoring and develop an elevated temperature or other symptoms, the local health department should inquire whether any household members have influenza or influenza-like illness. When the local health department calls the New Jersey Department of Health to consult with the regional epidemiologist and EBD team, please have the vaccination status and influenza exposure information as part of your initial situation report, in addition to the onset of and type of symptoms the person is reporting. Along with the new CDC resources, the New Jersey Department of Health has been working on resources including a protocol for direct active monitoring, a protocol for persons under active monitoring who are non-compliant, frequently asked questions for persons with a fever and recent travel, and resources for quarantine. This information will be distributed via links and posted on our website. And last, I will conclude by mentioning the recent funding opportunity that was announced via the New Jersey Association of County and City Health Officials. This funding opportunity includes reimbursement for activities under active monitoring. The activities are not specified and may include things like reimbursing staff, securing equipment for active monitoring, such as computers to access CDRSS on weekends, or resources to support site visits. The funding is based on a per person, per day formula, and in order to receive the funding, the local health department must document all active monitoring activities in CDRSS. There will be a conference call with the Office of Local Public Health and CDS EBD team to further explain these requirements. But as we've been emphasizing all along, local health departments are expected to do active monitoring seven days a week, including weekends and holidays, and document the active monitoring activities in CDRSS. Even if a person cannot be reached on a given day, 
there must be documentation of the attempt and outcome in CDRSS in order to get reimbursement for that person on that day. This information, in turn, helps our active monitoring process both in New Jersey and nationally. And also related to this item, there is the continued need for local health departments to continuously provide a phone number where persons under active monitoring and New Jersey Department of Health staff can reach local health department staff 24-7. And again, I just want to emphasize how much we appreciate and thank you for your continued efforts. Okay, thanks, Shereen. Um, before you go, uh, and again, uh, we're going to um, answer some of the questions that came in we did not get to, and if you have any new questions, um, please write them in the question box. Um, there was one, actually, um, since Shereen also works on Lyme disease, apart from uh, Ebola, uh, about uh, since Lyme is not really a communicable disease, uh, is it anticipated that health departments will continue to have to investigate elevated IgGs and two-tier positive results? Lyme disease is a nationally notifiable disease. Um, we do not foresee this uh, being eliminated from our reportable disease list anytime soon. Um, I certainly, we all understand uh, how labor intensive it is. Um, and since it is not a person to person communicable disease, um, I do recommend um, prioritizing your investigations. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I certainly um, would recommend that if you have limited staff and, for example, have a uh, suspect measles situation, that that receives your attention first. Um, but that being said, um, Lyme disease, unfortunately, will not be eliminated from our reportable list. Um, it is frustrating that some uh, doctors do order chronic serology on persons. It's also indicative of the imperfect testing we have in the first place. There is money being uh, targeted towards this nationally to encourage better testing. Uh, we are also exploring options through the CDC and CFTE um, to explore other potential ways to surveil for Lyme disease, um, for example, using some sort of sampling methodology that, that would allow us to make an uh, estimate on the number of cases, um, but that is uh, not anywhere near being implemented at this time. Um, if anyone has any concerns on the investigations in their, their county or how to prioritize, um, we could work with the regional epidemiologist and Lyme disease team um, and, uh, and move forward. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Ellen, a, a question on uh, if you're aware of a good information sheet that can be sent to patients with chronic hepatitis C. On the same website, there is a FAQ for Hep C, and I often use that link for um, Hep C advocates. Okay. Um, not not sure if everyone heard that, but uh, on, uh, on the state website under the Hepatitis C disease page, there is a FAQ that can be sent, and also the link that Ellen included at the end of her presentation for the uh, HCD advocate. Um, they also have very good uh, patient resources. Um, several questions about vaccine issues. Uh, maybe Liz and, and Barb, if you can um, address some of these. Uh, let me see here. A question on mumps. Uh, if there was a suspect mumps uh, in a child in a provider waiting room, um, is this situation something that would require an immediate response? This is Elizabeth. Um, if mumps is not an immediately notifiable, immediately notifiable disease, um, so no, would you not, I mean, we would want the person to be isolated. So if it's a patient, we would want them to be isolated, and that would need to be put into place right away. But as far as a waiting room, it's not measles. Measles would require immediate follow-up of the persons in the waiting area. As far as the mumps, it would not be an immediate follow-up. This, this, this is Barbara. Uh, mumps is considered droplet spread as opposed to measles, which is airborne. Uh, so the precautions that you take are different. Uh, if you hear about a mumps, case in a physician's office, I think the key is to make sure that they're getting the viral specimens so, so that we can actually uh, diagnose the individual. That would, only, that would be the only immediate action taken just to say, did you get the viral specimens? Okay. Um, a couple questions on the 317 vaccine funds. Um, 
can you clarify a little bit about what loosening of the uh, recommendations would mean? And also, uh, is there any need for adults to know their prior vaccination history before being immunized for the 317 funding? So, so in terms of loosening uh, the screening for insurance in a mass clinic situation does not need to occur. So people who are insured can receive the vaccine. Now, obviously, we don't want to waste resources. So if you know that the people are insured, then obviously we wouldn't want to use the vaccine. But in a mass situation where you don't have time to do extensive screening, uh, we're not holding people to the same uh, requirements for screening for insurance. So you don't have to screen uh, as you do normally. And this is just for measles. If you're doing some sort of a mass clinic and it's more than the measles vaccine, then the, uh, the normal processes are in place and you do need to, to do screening. This is specific for the measles vaccine because of the situation that we're in. And in terms of uh, adults need to know their prior vaccination history prior to being immunized, uh, I'm not exactly sure what that means. I mean, we're encouraging people to be vaccinated. A lot of adults don't know if they've been vaccinated or not, in which case you do vaccinate those individuals. There's no harm in receiving another vaccine if the individual uh, doesn't know their vaccination status. Okay. Um, uh, one other question about measles. Um, is, the, is the state planning on sending guidance to school and daycare? Um, Perhaps when we have time, as you can imagine, we're going a little bananas here. Um, this, this is partly why I mentioned on the, on the webinar today, because your school should be reaching out to you guys for assistance. And none of this guidance has changed. They should know what the vaccine status is in their schools. They should know which children have exemptions. Um, they should be comfortable working with you. Um, and then if there were any kind of exclusions or notifications, you and us would be working with them. So if we have an opportunity to pull together some, some quick guidance, certainly we'd be happy to do that. But um, nothing really has changed, and, um, you know, that's a little lower on the priority list right now. Um, you know, not against it. I just can't promise that it will be out today, tomorrow, next week, next month. We'll work on it, though. Uh, is there a separate vaccine for measles that is available, or does, is it always included uh, with the in the MMR vaccine? In the United States, there are no separate measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines. The only vaccine that is available is the MMR vaccine. Uh, would a mass clinic for measles vaccination be a directive by the state health department? No. Okay. I can't imagine us ever directing uh, a mass vaccination clinic. I mean, in situations where there's exposure, we make recommendations as to who should be vaccinated in the time frame, but we don't direct a mass vaccination clinic. Okay. Um, this next question I'm, I'm thinking is maybe in response to uh, like a measles situation. Uh, what is the role of a public health nurse in contact investigation after a healthcare facility has reported um, a, a disease or an exposure in, in that facility? So this is sort of a tricky one. Um, the public, so when a measles situation occurs, there's a lot of um, working parts and things happening all at the same time. We would prefer that the medical provider, be it a hospital or an individual doctor, work on the exposures that have occurred in their facility. Most, on a smaller scale, most private physicians um, actually prefer to work directly with their patients because they would be the ones dealing with any potential post-exposure prophylaxis if appropriate and appropriately timed. Um, they can also educate their patients and work on the, you know, uh, um, obtaining proof of immunity. Um, and then the local health departments would be working on other community exposures, for example, working with the schools, working with um, perhaps restaurants in the area, other potential exposures in the community. The state health department at the same time would be working if there were any out-of-jurisdiction exposures, for example, if the patient had traveled to New York City or California or wherever, also if there were any flight notifications. Um, the local health department can work with the healthcare facility. Certainly, we, you know, it's all hands on deck. We want to help each other. If there are no additional exposures, certainly the state can work with, um, you know, assisting with contact investigations. We have done that in other large scale investigations. Um, 
So typically we would like the medical facility to work on their contacts um, and notifying them and answering questions and helping those patients. The locals to work on more of the local community um, exposures that have occurred. And the state would work on other jurisdictions and, and um, assisting with the locals and the healthcare providers. I hope that answers the question. Okay, one additional question. Um, will adults, um, older adults, like say over age 60, who had measles illness as a child be advised to get an MMR shot at this time? The problem is that you don't know if the person actually had uh, measles as a child or not because it wasn't documented. So uh, now, specifically for healthcare providers, birth before 1957 is not considered absolute proof of immunity. Uh, for healthcare providers, it's recommended that those individuals get vaccinated and uh, or have uh, an IgG done. Okay. All right. Um, several questions on flu um, and different uh, outbreak reporting. Uh, just a, a comment, and, and we certainly hear this all the time as well, that schools love to work with that percentage when um, considering if something is an outbreak and that 10% we just can't seem to uh, get rid of. Um, so how can we help schools understand that they shouldn't wait until the 10% uh, threshold is reached? Yeah, and that's a great question and something that um, uh, I've been working with Barbara Carruthers a lot on, especially during the flu season because um, you know, you're going to get influenza cases in a school um, that occur um, just as part of a community transmission. Um, and, and it's important that when um, those initial cases are reported that prevention measures be put in place so that kids aren't coming to school and spreading it to others. Um, and so even in those particular cases, um, you know, the question is, you know, when do you determine it's an outbreak and when don't you? Um, and essentially if you have cases that are above normal in that particular school, um, we'd like you to call us and report it so that we can give you some uh, prevention and control measures that you can put in place to try to prevent additional students from becoming ill in that setting. Um, I would also advise anybody who has these types of questions to um, review the school guidance document that's posted to our website. Um, and um, if there are specific questions that come up regarding this, you can always reach out to Barbara Carruthers, who is our daycare and school um, outbreak coordinator here. Um, we do address some of the 10% reporting, and we give some um, specific guidance on when schools should and should not be reporting outbreaks. And so I would highly encourage you to review that document. Um, we specifically address this concern um, in that document as far as outbreak reporting is concerned. Okay. Um, question on the accuracy of the rapid flu test. Uh, if the clinical picture and management of the patient would be unaffected, why should a rapid test be performed? And, and that's, a, that's also a great question. And from an individual standpoint, if a clinician is treating an individual, certainly that's an individual um, clinical decision on their part, whether they want to provide antivirals and whether they want to know that it has, is actually influenza or not. Um, when you take it out of the individual perspective and you actually look at some of these institutional perspectives, we really want to know that there's a confirmed etiology such as influenza, whether it be by a rapid test or another method. Um, I'm not saying that rapid tests are the, the, the worst thing in the world, but they do have to be taken with a grain of salt um, as, as, with regard to their accuracy. However, if you have an institutional outbreak and you have a single person with a rapid positive and you have other res residents with respiratory illness, we are con considering that a confirmed outbreak and that does impact clinical management and that we would then recommend treatment for those that are ill and prophylaxis for all other residents who are not ill in that particular facility. So in those particular circumstances, testing is critical. Uh, question about influenza B. Does that tend to affect children more so than adults or and older adults? Um, influenza B um, is, tends to be a little bit milder uh, illness. Um, influenza A, particularly influenza AH3, tends to be much more severe. Um, I wouldn't say that it does not impact influenza, uh, it does not impact older adults. Um, as in previous seasons, um, different circulating B viruses have caused significant outbreaks in long-term care facilities. Um, and so I think it's very strain specific um, in the um, epidemiology um, that influenza B impacts. Um, but certainly in general, we often will see that we receive more test results on children simply because children are being taken to the doctors and being tested more. Um, so I think that that might just be a surveillance um, impact, but in general, um, influenza B tends to be more mild than influenza A. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, with that, I think we've uh, answered most of the questions. So um, just uh, on your slides that you'll see, uh, just a reminder, we did have a couple questions. The slides are posted 
on NJLMN under the Practice Exchange if you'd like to download them. And uh, these are some uh, relevant training opportunities coming up that you may be interested in. Uh, the first two, um, I'm, I know most of our uh, public health nurses are very familiar with the Pink Book, and uh, CDC is actually coming to do an in-person training on the Pink Book um, update. So, uh, you know, this might be interesting. It is in um, Piscataway, and I put the registration link there. The, um, the NICE course for uh, infection control is coming up in April. There will be a uh, CDS will be holding a foodborne disease uh, investigation course for local health departments. That date will be March 26 in Sayreville. That's on NJLMN. And um, one thing I didn't include on this slide is the communicable disease investigator training that has been done in the past. Uh, that is uh, trying to be offered annually, and there will be one coming up probably this spring. So stay tuned for that. And uh, in terms of our communicable disease forums, uh, again, we will be going to the in-person meetings uh, for the spring. And the south and northwest states have been set. Uh, they're on the screen. And we're still working with um, partners in the northeast and central to come up with some good locations there. So we'll be sending them out when we have them. And in terms of valuations and credits, um, hopefully all of you have registered on NJLMN. Um, everyone on NJLMN uh, will be receiving a, an email with an evaluation link. Um, the bulk email from NJLMN often does things to the web link. So if you can't get it, just you can respond to me directly and I'll make sure you get it. Uh, the evaluation will be active for one week. And if you watch the webinar as a group, um, we will need a group sign-in sheet. Uh, so uh, any kind of a sign-in sheet, just put the name of the forum, today's date, uh, the participant's name and signature organization, and the NJLMN email. And you can send that to me by email um, or by fax. And uh, that's what I'll use to mark you off as attended on NJLMN if I don't have your name and email on the GoToWebinar report. So if you have public health credits, uh, once we get those uh, group sign-in sheets and the evaluations, your credits will just appear. And on the online evaluation, nurses must include their name and email address. Um, for everyone else, you don't need to include that information. But based on that, that's how we will email you your nursing certificate with your contact hours. Um, and with that, I just want to thank everyone for attending. And uh, again, if you have any suggestions for topics or uh, that you would like included in the spring forums, or again, if you have something that you would like to um, share at one of the forums. We're certainly open to those suggestions, too. So you can include them on your evaluation or um, send me an email at any time. And uh, with that, thank you very much.